managers and will be subject to screening for symptoms of COVID-19. Any person exhibiting such symptoms will not be permitted to enter City Hall, but will be able to participate through the remote options described above. These public comment options established and provided for today comply with section 286.0114 and section 120.54 of the Florida statutes. The city has published an agenda as well included as well as included in the notice to the public pursuant to city code, the items and the topics that will be discussed at this virtual board meeting. Additionally, the public has been given opportunity to provide public comment during the meeting, which is at City Hall and the public comment form and within reasonable proximity in time before and during the meeting via the public comment voicemail, the form, and the video upload, as well as the live public comment by phone. Moreover, section 286.0114-4C of the Florida statute specifically authorizes the city to prescribe procedures or forms for an individual to use in order to inform the board or commission of a desire to be heard to indicate his or her support, opposition, or neutrality on a position. The city through its five public comment options has provided five different procedures to indicate support, opposition, or neutrality on the items. The city has provided information on how to submit comments in the notice to the public and on a dedicated web page. Board members, are you comfortable with all of the notice provisions and public comments set forth in these uniform rules of procedure that we've established? Yes. 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 That's all I have. Yes. Um, just making sure you all could hear me. Yes. Okay. Welcome. I figured it out. I have, before we proceed, I have one question, and that is, are we getting all the public comments before we start the hearing? That's what was indicated on the agenda I got. Yes. So um, I believe there are a few public comments that, um, that will be heard at the beginning of the meeting rather than during the actual item. Right. Just making sure. Well, that's what we're ready for now is for the public comments from the podium, which I'm guessing is City Hall Lobby. City Hall Lobby. Unmute. There's a uh, high Rachel Lee Law Department. There's nobody at City Hall for comment. Except our, except our wonderful security guard. Good to see you. I was here to swear in applicants, but nobody's here. So. Okay, thank you very much. Just to hang out with a Mets fan. It's terrible. <laughs> okay, next we go to live callback from pre-registered constituents. Do we have any of those? No. How about playback video no. or audio public comment? Erica? Yes, I'm here. I'm trying to do the playback and it says host disabled participant screen sharing. I'm gonna try to play and let me know if you all can hear this. Ready? Okay. Good afternoon, this is Christine Ross, Executive Director of the Heritage Trust, one nine zero Southeast 12 Terrace, Miami, 33131. I'm calling about the Tuesday, June 23rd Historic and Environmental Pres Preservation Board meeting, and in particular, HEPB 5, item 7340, the resolution uh, to encourage the HEP board to concur with staff and move the designation process forward on the beautiful St. Peter's Church at 1811 Northwest 4th Court in Overtown. They heard his trust has been working with the minister at the church for well over two years to assist in a variety of issues at the church and we believe this church is such a significant structure in overtown and it's charming lovely architecturally significant and means so much to the community it is deserving of historic designation and again we encourage the board to move the designation process forward thank you for your time 
Thank you. Any more? Any and other? that concludes the public comment. The, I'm sorry, the, the recorded public comment. Thank you. And now we have online public comment from the forum. Um, I forwarded um, an email to all of you earlier today. So there was just that one? Yeah, just that one. Okay. Then that concludes the public comment period. And we're on to um, the election of a vice chair. So the floor is open for nominations for vice chair of the Historic Environmental Preservation Board. I would nominate Todd Tregash if he would be interested in that. <laughs> I would second that nomination. So motion and a second, Mr. Tregash, would you accept? Yeah, I do. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other nominations? Is there a motion to elect Mr. Tregash as vice chair by acclamation? Make a motion to elect Todd Tregash. I second. Motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Welcome. And thank you for, for your service that you will be providing like you have in the past. Uh, thank now, you. I believe uh, we need to approve the minutes from the March 3rd, 2020 meeting. Is there, does anyone have a copy? Did everyone get a copy? Nope. Yeah, I think we, I didn't get one. So I will recommend that we approve those minutes at our next meeting, unless there is objection. Seeing none, are there any monthly updates from staff, Mr. Adams? Um, yes, I can give you some updates. Um, I'll be looking at my screen while I'm, while I'm giving these to you. Um, the first update is from the Olympia Theatre. Um, I received this update um, on June the 2nd from Robert Geithner. And it's regarding the Olympia Building Facade Project Phase 1. The Flagler District Bed and Downtown Neighbours Alliance have taken the lead on a community-based vision approach to the future of the Olympia. Both organisations are restarting meetings with city leadership downtown stakeholders in the community. There was an article in last week's Miami Today that is perhaps the first time the Olympia has been positioned as a community asset with preservation first since the initial press when Olympia Centre Inc. started managing the Olympia. The selection committee to review the RFQ 18-19036R submissions has not been formally appointed as the project is on hold at the City of Miami. Olympia Center Inc. requested another extension on the grant agreement from the Florida Division of Historical Resources on May 27th, 2020. The division approved the extension um, on June the, June the 2nd, 2020. Does anyone have any questions on this item? No? Okay, the next update I will give is for the um, proposed amendments to Chapter 23, which will be going to City Commission this Thursday for review. If you remember at a meeting a while ago, we had discussed some of the, the proposed amendments. The first one being that a supermajority vote would be required to um, designate a property and the board did raise some concerns about the, the wording because it wouldn't be possible for a supermajority to effectively make a nomination. So the wording would now read proposals for designation may be made to the board by a supermajority vote of its members after one member of the board requests it to be placed on a board agenda. Um, these nominations can still be made by the mayor, the city manager, Resolution of the Planning, Zoning and Appeals Board approved by a supermajority. Resolution of the City Commission approved by a supermajority. And by resolution, resolution of the County Historic Preservation Board by a supermajority. And a non-profit organization of five years with a recognized interest in historic preservation approved by a supermajority. Does anyone have any questions on that particular section before I move on? 
How will we find out whether an organization has approved something with a supermajority or not? We would no doubt need their minutes of the meeting. So basically the way it reads now is one board member can place it on the agenda, but to move it forward would require a supermajority vote of the, of the board members. And that's the same for any other body of, of people that need to be a supermajority. And if a board member wants to bring that up as part of their um, the, the, putting it on the agenda, do they have to do that in any specific way? They can just bring it to staff and, and add it to the agenda. You can bring it to the staff and add it to the agenda, I believe. Yeah, only one board member has to add it, but it requires a super majority to, to move forward. Understood. Okay, the next section where there was a um, major, well, not a major change, but there were changes. Um, the owner of a property or his or her designated agent or attorney which is the subject of such designation shall be notified by mail at least 30 days prior to the board's meeting and 15 days prior to subsequent administrative appellate hearings. Previously, that was 15 days and 10 days. That is now being extended to 30 days and 15 days. Are we okay with any comment on that? No? Okay. Um, the next section um, with regard to, sorry. Are you okay? um, people now have 60 days to appeal a designation to the city commission. So um, the appeals can now be filed up to 60 days after the designation. Um, Previously, it was 15 days. Any comments on that? Who has standing to uh, ask for an appeal? The chapter 23 has now been changed to state that the property owner, any one member of the city commission, the planning department, or any aggrieved party that has standing under Florida law may appeal to the city commission. Um, I have a question. I'm just curious. It went from 15 days to, you said, 60 days? That's the proposal, yes. This, these these amend, proposed amendments were made by um, the city commissioner. Um, I did bring them to you several months ago, and that's when you raised the objection about you would need a supermajority to nominate something, which, which obviously isn't possible. So these are the proposed amendments that will be um, going to city commission this Thursday. And I'm just curious about the uh, uh, what's more um, conventional with, say, the county or other municipalities. And I, I can see that it should increase from 15 days, but 60 days. Oftentimes, uh, the applicants ready to to uh, move forward with their project and to delay it for another uh, two months could be excessive. So, could you just find out is if the county's using 30 days, maybe that's the, the right number. I can try to find out. And this is for um, this is for um, I believe only designations. Yeah, this is this is for designations and mm -hmm. appeal against the designation. Okay. okay. Right. Um the next proposed amendment, um, main one. I'll just find it here. This was actually requested by the board, and this is regarding special certificates of appropriateness that have a public hearing. Um, notice shall also be sent by mail to all owners of property within 500 feet of the property lines of the subject property at least 10 calendar days prior to the hearing. So this was actually an amendment that was um, re requested um, by the board. Any questions or discussion on that? No. And I believe that those are the major changes. 
Any other questions on these or should I move on? Give me one second, please. Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. Um, the next update I have is, um, do the board members recall the three round properties and um, property in Miami at 2926 Northwest 18th Avenue? This is a property that has three um, elderly low income housing buildings on it. The three structures are circular. There is a proposal to build a new um, a new structure in front of these buildings, which would obscure the view from the street. This was subject to a section 106 review. I prepared a report on it, and my opinion to the state was that, that they weren't eligible for national register listing. Um, ultimately, the state disagreed with that. They, they believe they were eligible for listing. And they determined that the new construction would pose an adverse effect to a National Register eligible property because the new structure will be built in front of the towers, technically partly obscuring their view from the street. Um, as part of the mitigation measures, the related group have agreed to carry out a HABS survey of one of the towers and install historic information on the site. Um, this mitigation measure has been agreed to by the state. The Advisory Council on Historic Preservation are going to take no further part in this. There was a web page up for the public to provide comments. We received about six comments, three in favour of the designation and, and three against. Now, I should clarify there is no intent at the moment for the state to designate the site. They have merely determined it is eligible. Um, so the proposal to survey one of the towers and put historic information on the site has been put into a memorandum of agreement. We will be hoping that that MOA will be going to the City Commission in the near future. So to sum it all up, the state believe the site is eligible, the new construction will be an adverse effect, the proposed mitigation measures have been accepted by the state and the ACHP, and we're in the process of having that agreement um, taken to city commission for them to approve the city manager to sign it. And at the moment, there is no intent to move forward with the National Register designation, but ultimately the state could should we decide to. Any questions? No? Okay, that's all of the updates I have. Thank you. I guess uh, any anything from any board members? No. Then I guess. Um, we'll... I, I believe Denise mentioned she may have something she would like to bring up. Oh yes, I wanted to ask, just as a matter of record, um, if there's any process or procedures in place for our board when it comes to designated properties that are being neglected. Um, I just happened to come across one during, you know, this whole shutdown walking and found out quite a bit of history about the property and tried to contact the owners and I actually was able to go inside the property and it's, it's in horrible, you know, condition and it's rapidly deteriorating and it's a huge part of our Miami history. Um, chapter 20. It's called the Ramsey House. It's in Little Hill. Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, I guess the question is for you, um, Warren, is there something that we can do to call attention to a property? I, I noticed it was designated. I found the report from 2017 and it changed um, ownership during that time. So now it's owned by some sort of real estate group that's not really doing anything with it. What I can do is I can bring this to the attention of our code department. Um, we've been working very closely with code over the past five or six months. 
and code have been really good at going out and addressing any of these issues. So I can bring it to the attention of the code department and we can um, allow them to visit the site and then take any, any action that they deem necessary. So other than citing them with violations, there's really nothing else we could do as a board? Well, chapter 23 specifically prohibits someone deliberately allowing a property to, to fall into disrepair. So um, code do have, you know, they do have that to, to fall back on. Um, I'm happy to speak with code and then give you an update and let you know what, what they get back to me with and how, how we're going to, going to address. Okay, sorry for giving you more work. <laughs> Also, um, Mr. Adams, in the next meeting or two, would you be able to give us an update on the, what has happened with MET3 in terms of the provisions that we approved for uh, their mitigation? Yes, I can have that for you for the July meeting in a couple oh, of weeks. Great. Okay. Thanks. That's the, the MET Square project? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And I guess we're now ready to start the public hearing. So we'll ready for number one. Have item number one, file ID 7508, a resolution of the Miami Historic and Environmental Preservation Board pursuant to section 23-6.2 of the City Code of Ordinances, approving or denying a special certificate of appropriateness for alterations to a contributing property located approximately at 537 Northeast 70th Street, Miami, Florida, 33138, within the Palm Grove Historic District. Is the applicant present? So please unmute yourself and give your name and address for the record. <clears throat> yes, Alessio Lo Curto, 537 Northeast 70th Street, Miami, Florida, 33138. Thank you, and we'll start with a staff report, and then we'll come back to you. Okay, thank you. I don't think the applicant has been sworn in. Mr. Lucorto, have you been sworn in? Yes, I am. Have you been sworn in? Yes, in the beginning. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, can you, can you just confirm, um, were you at City Hall to be sworn in? No, I sent a um, a notarite notice that you sent me via email. Because there are, there are two options to be sworn in, um, which which should have been clearly communicated to you. The first is to go to City Hall in person to be sworn in um, by a notary public there or to have a notary public at your remote location to swear you in. Did you do one of those two? I things? did the, the second one. So you, ha you had a notary at your location? Yes. And, and I, sent, I sent it via email. Um. What do you mean you sent it via email? Well, I was asking and I, I notarized why you asked me to do so. There was a, a, a release, whole okay. harmless an identification agreement, and that's what I sent. Right. That is something separate from, from you swearing it, from you being sworn in. I was not um, I was not aware they were, nobody told me um, we did have a meeting with with all of the applicants um, I'm not sure if you were there you should have been invited to that meeting and we let them know um, all the requirements in, including that specific work requirement to be sworn in yes we were told that he and one other applicant were supposed to go to City Hall today to be sworn in but nobody showed up Mm, that I was not aware. Okay. 
Yeah, it, it seems as though you you notified um, hearing boards that you would go that you would opt to go to City Hall in the beginning of, of the meeting to be sworn in, um, but you you didn't. Oh, I misunderstood myself. Sorry. So that's probably the reason why. I'm sorry. No, it's it, it's um. <laughs> don't apologize. Yeah. Um, you know, it is an issue, though, because we, we do have a requirement for applicants to, to be sworn in. Um, so I, I think this is going to have to be rescheduled. Um, I, I don't know what the agenda look like, if, if it could occur at the, the next agenda or not. Um, but that is a requirement. Okay, so I the release that I did is is that I have to go to the city myself in present? So you can either the the release is, is something else that that is just acknowledging that you are um, you know that that was explained to you as well, but it was um, just acknowledging that you are okay with the virtual proceedings and you won't challenge them, etc. Um, that that's different from having from being sworn in. Um, so you either need to, next time you either need to go to City Hall to be sworn in there, make, make arrangements with hearing boards, um, or you can, you can find your own notary public to come to your remote location to swear you in. I know, I was not aware of this. And I mean, it's such an emergency <laughs> myself. Incredible because my insurance expired today at midnight. Is is there an opportunity to move ahead if the applicant does not speak? And I'm only asking this because I'm aware of the um, urgency of this particular request. Or is as another option to allow the applicant to? I'm not sure how far from City Hall he is. Go to City Hall and get sworn in and move this item to the end of the agenda. So um, in regard to your second question, if he can go to City Hall um, and somebody is there to swear them in, then yes, because we arranged for somebody to be there at 3 p.m. So I, I, I don't know if anybody's there to swear him in or not. Um, so we would have to confirm those two things that he can get there and that somebody's there to swear him in. Um, in regard to your second or your first question um you know if he doesn't you know ha doesn't provide any any testimony and doesn't speak um i if he is okay <laughs> with with that um you know i i i am concerned a little bit because he he is he's the applicant and he's he's entitled to speak um and, and he should be afforded that opportunity to speak. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, this is an it's an economic hardship request, so I really do think the applicant should speak, which I think would leave the only opportunity if there's a possibility for him to get sworn in and remove the item to later in the agenda is the only, the only way to move forward. You're... Warren, I'm, I'm not sure if anybody else is having a little trouble hearing you. You're, you're just very low. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's better. Yeah, this is a request for economic hardship, so I do believe it would be in the applicant's interests to speak, um, which would mean that the, the only option he has is to try and get sworn in at some time before the end of the meeting, and I don't even know if that is is possible now if there's anyone at City Hall. Right. So um, if, if he can somehow get a notary public or um, Beatrice, do you have any um, contacts? I, I, I can try to find out if the person we had there from my department is still there. I, I don't think she is because... Yes, she is. She's still there. She's still there. Um, so, Mr. Uh, Locorto, yes. are, is it possible for you to travel to 
City Hall, um, you will need to wear a mask and, and follow all of those procedures to get sworn in or, or, or um, have a notary public come to your home to swear you in or, your, or wherever you're real. No, I am in my house right now. I'm in my house. I, I'm, I'm four lock, so I, I have no, nowhere to go. <laughs> Okay, so I, I, I think your options are um, you can either continue this to, you can request a continuance for the next meeting if the board wants to put you on the next meeting, or you can um, travel to City Hall to be sworn in. Right now? Right now. Okay. Um, I am, Beatrice, you said you confirmed with Rachel that she's still there? Okay, can you ask her to, or do you plan on, on going to City Hall, sir? Yes. Okay, make sure you, you um, bring a mask. Yes. You have a mask to wear? Yes, I do. Um, and, okay, if, if that's what you choose to do, somebody is there to swear you in, um, and then we'll bring up your item later. Okay, so let me go right now to the City Hall. Can you provide me the address exactly? Yes. It, do you have a pen and paper? Yes, I do. It is 3500 mm -hmm. Pan American Drive. Mm -hmm. And that's Miami, Florida. I want to let, let me look up the zip. I think it's 33133, but let me look it up. Um, Beatrice, do you have his email address? Maybe it's best to... Yeah, I can email it to him. Can you email you? it to Thank him? Thank you, Beatrice. It, it's, in, it's in Coconut Grove. Do I need to, to, to tell anyone that I, I'm, what I'm going to do? Are you going to be traveling to City Hall to be sworn in, sir? Yes. Okay. Well, we'll so, um, somebody's there to swear you in. Okay. Thank you so much. I, I, so, is, without, is there any objection for this item being moved to the end of the agenda? I don't see anybody raising their hand. So, so no, uh, no objection. So we'll move on to item number two. Uh, I think we have um, a city staff that needs to be sworn in. Go ahead. Quatisha. I'm here if somebody needs to be sworn in. Thank He's you, coming. Somebody, somebody is on their way. Yes. Thank you. I'm having another meeting on here, so I'm multitasking. Thank you. Do we? Do we get? I guess we'll go we? to the next item. Okay. Have item two, file ID seven three four seven. A resolution of the Miami Historic and Environmental Preservation Board pursuant to section 23-6.1 of the City Code of Ordinances, approving or denying a special certificate of appropriateness for a waiver of the required parking to a contributing property located approximately at 818 Northeast 71st Street, Miami, Florida 33138 within the Bayside Historic District. Is the applicant present? Yes, um, he's also has not been sworn in. Who is the applicant? Uh, Mr. Whalen. Hello. Hi. Yes, go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. Yes, my uh, my notary is on his way. He had a take a call and he's coming right back into the office. Okay. okay. He 
should be no more than a moment. I just he just waved for me. Amber. Yes. I'm going to interrupt. I do want to be signing as well. I have my notary here. If the if the opportunity is good now. Yes. Or whenever the opportunity presents itself for me to be sworn in. This is as good as time as any. Go ahead. Okay. The notary's here. Now's good. There we go. Okay. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the true to the whole truth and the nothing but the truth? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like me to proceed with the staff analysis? Yes, go ahead. We can we can do that, Amber. I can proceed with the analysis before the applicant is sworn in. Yes, that's fine. Pursuant to section 23-6.1 of the City Code of Ordinances, uh, the applicant is requesting a special certificate of appropriateness for a waiver to allow for a reduction of the required parking space in the second layer of a residential property located in a parcel zone T3L suburban transit zone. The subject property is located within the Bayside Historic District, Baywood subdivision and the Upper East Side net area. In accordance with the building permit application for the enclosure of a garage, the Office of Zoning reviewed the application for compliance with the Miami code and found the proposed enclosure to be in violation of Miami 21 requirements for working in a T3L zone. In the Miami 21 code, the applicant applied for a for a waiver of required parking in the second layer. The applicant pursuant to section 23-6.11a is requesting a waiver of the required in the second as required for a T3L single family residence under Article 4, Table 4 of the Miami 21 Zoning Code. The applicant proposes a second driveway in the first layer, maintaining two parking spaces. The owner requests this waiver of the second layer parking in order to enclose the current garage. Preservation staff finds that the approval of the waiver will not have a negative impact on the historic property. Findings consistent. And pursuant to section 23-6.1 of the code and article 7 of the Miami 21 code, the preservation office recommends approval with conditions of the special COE for a waiver. Condition 1, the site shall be developed pursuant to the plans as prepared by Wayne Farrell, consisting of 17 sheets submitted under PZ 195076. The plans are deemed as being incorporated by reference herein. Two, the parking waiver eliminates the required parking in the second layer. Three, this resolution shall be included in the permit set. Mr. Whalen, are you ready to be sworn in? Yes, I am. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, I don't know what's next. I just have my notary here. Uh, ask him to, to, to have you swear to tell the truth. Oh. Right. oh, Patrick, do you swear to tell the truth? Yes, sir. Fantastic. I guess that'll work. Do you have anything to prayer. add to the staff report? No, sir. Well, that's sort of short and sweet. Is there any discussion from the board? Any questions or comments? 
Might have got a motion. I believe you all can unmute yourselves if you have a, when you're ready to make a motion or a comment. Um, I'd like to make a motion to um, approve the um, special certificate of appropriateness for a waiver of the required parking to a contributing building located at approximately 818 Northeast 71st Street, uh, Miami, Florida, um, within the Bayside Historic District. Uh, furthermore, to add the staff's recommendation um, of conditions. The site shall be developed pursuant to the plans that prepared by Wayne Farrell, consisting of 17 sheets submitted under PZ 195076. The plans are deemed being incorporated by reference herein. Item two, uh, the parking waiver eliminates the required parking in the second layer. And number three, the resolution shall be included in the permit set. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Prieto Munoz has seconded. Any discussion on the motion? No, can we have a roll call, please? Mr. Tregash? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Prieto y Munoz? Yes. Mr. Andrade? Yes. Mr. Colley? Yes. Ms. Galvez Turros? Yes. Ms. Odell? Yes. Mr. Trachtenberg? Yes. And Dr. Hopper? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. And this decision is final unless appealed to hearing boards within 15 days. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Todd Tregish. Um, I need to take a 10, 15 minute break. So I'll, I'll be back. Okay. I'll tell you a spot. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll move on to item number three. Hep item number three, file ID 6674, a resolution of the Miami Historic and Environmental Preservation Board pursuant to section 23-6.2 of the City Code of Ordinances, approving or denying an application for a special certificate of appropriateness to permit the new construction of a single family residence located at approximately 713 Northwest 7th Street, 7th Street Road within the Spring Garden Historic District. Is the applicant present? Who is the applicant? Jessica Collazo. Uh, Jessica is here and she's also my notary. Yeah. I'm here with Jessica Collazo. Have you been sworn in yet? We're having a little bit of trouble hearing you, I believe. Um, you may just want to come a little bit closer to your speaker. Okay. Um, but but typically, I mean, the 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 notary will will ask you to raise your right hand and to um, just swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Any testimony? Yes. And chair also has to do that. Simon Cantillo, raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. And you are the applicant? The applicant is Ms. Castellon, who's also the owner. 
or was it Jessica? Or Jessica sent that out. We're having trouble hearing you. Yes, we're the applicants for the project. Can you hear me better now? Not really. I'm going to try and get uh, a headset. That might work better. I think so. That's a little better, thank you. Okay. okay, we'll start with the staff report. Sure. Okay, this application is for a special certificate of appropriateness to allow for the new construction of a single family residence. Um, the subject property is within the Spring Garden Historic District, the Spring Garden Subdivision, and the Overtown Net area. Um, there's some history with this property. On July 7th, 2015, the HEC denied an application for a special certificate of appropriateness for demolition of a contributing resource and new construction of a single family home. On October 22nd, 2015, City Commission granted an appeal of resolution HEP R 15056. On January 5th, 2016, the HEP approved with conditions an application for a special certificate of appropriateness for new construction of a single family residence. And um, this uh, project actually never moved ahead. On November 5th, 2019, the HEC deferred the current applicant's request for a special certificate of appropriateness for the new construction of a single family residence. The subject plot is currently vacant and the proposed new single family residence is a two-storey structure of contemporary design that incorporates several design cues from the wood frame structure that previously occupied the site. Construction is of concrete block and stucco with a fl flat roof with parapet. The height to the um, top of the the height to the top of the parapet is approximately 23 six feet six inches. The front elevation is three bays. The first floor of the northernmost bay is set back approximately 13 feet from the front elevation, and the second floor of the northernmost bay is set back approximately 30 feet from the front elevation. The front elevation is of board formed stucco designed to look like horizontal wood siding and smooth stucco. The windows are all the same size and equally spaced. The front door is centrally located. The carport is covered with a green roof which wraps around the front of the structure to cover the entry and there is a concrete eyebrow over the second storey windows. The side elevations will be of board form stucco and smooth stucco. The north elevation will have regularly placed windows. The south elevations will have windows in a more irregular pattern. The rear elevation will be of board form stucco and smooth stucco. The majority of the wall area is glazed with windows and sliding doors. There are eyebrows over the first and second floor windows. There are railings around the second floor terraces and the pool deck. Uh, they will be dark brown anodized aluminum flat bars. The first floor is 2958 square feet. The second floor is approximately 1528 square feet. The front setback is 30 feet 6 inches. The rear setback is 30 feet 6 inches and the pool setback is 12 feet. The side setbacks are 5 feet 2 inches to the north and 5 feet 6 inches to the south. There will be green buttonwoods in the right of way and the front yard will contain a mixture of landscaping. The 10 foot wide driveway parking area under the carport and the walkway to the front door will be of pervious pavers. To the front of the property will be a six foot high smooth stucco wall topped with a decorative aluminum slat fence, pedestrian access via an aluminum louver door and vehicular access will be via an aluminum louver rolling gate. Per section 23-6.2H1, um, 
For applications relating to new construction, the proposed work shall not adversely affect the historic architectural or aesthetic character of the subject, subject structure or the relationship and congruity between the subject structure and its neighbouring structures and surroundings, including but not limited to form, spacing, height, yards, materials, colour or rhythm and pattern of window and door openings. With regard to the form, the proposed structure has a contemporary appearance. However, it takes a number of design cues from existing historic structures in the district and the wood frame house that previously occupied the site, including board form stucco that resembles wood siding, smooth stucco, a flat roof with parapet, eyebrows, a covered entry, a carport, a three bay front elevation with an appropriate window and door pattern. The overall design of the structure resembles the historic structure that previously occupied the site. However, the roof is flat instead of pitched. The first and second floor setbacks of the normal most bay reduce the overall massing. With spacing, the proposed setbacks are consistent with historic structures in the district. Height, the two-storey height is consistent with historic structures in the district. Yards, the front yard incorporates a pervious paver walkway and driveway and landscaping. The side yards are of sod, landscaping and concrete pavers. Approximately half of the rear yard is taken up with the swimming pool and deck and the remainder is sod. The backyard is smaller than most of the other historic properties in the river. However, there are examples of smaller rear setbacks with less landscaping. The materials are consistent with those used in historic structures in the district and the proposed fenestration on the front elevation is consistent. In addition to the above, in 2016, the HEP approved a new single family residence that resembled the historic structure that was demolished. Although staff did not agree with replicating the historic structure and simulating wood siding with stucco, the HEP approved the application with the conditions listed. The proposed residence was never built, however the conditions shall still be considered for this application. One, all glass shall be clear. The applicant has confirmed the glass shall be clear low E. Two, the exterior wall finishing shall be as indicated, which is five eighths inch stucco with simulated planking and top of the eight inch concrete masonry windows. The plan show board form stucco that resembles horizontal wood siding. Three, the applicant consider a tile roof instead of asphalt shingle. The plans indicate that a flat roof is proposed. Four, historic preservation staff shall oversee the design details with the goal that the new building pays some homage to the frame vernacular building that existed on the property before. Such details shall include but not be limited to the representation of horizontal siding in a contemporary way. The applicant has worked with staff. The front elevation is similar to that of the frame vernacular building as it has two floors and three bays, rectangular windows of a similar size, a carport and covered entrance and simulated horizontal siding designed in a contemporary way. And the applicant is subject to approval by zoning, building and all other required city departments. The proposed design therefore observes almost all of the above conditions. The applicant did consider a pitched roof during meetings with staff, but opted for a flat roof due to its better performance in hurricanes. The property is located within a moderate probability archaeological conservation area. A certificate to dig shall be required during the permitting phase for ground disturbing work. And the recommendation is for approval with conditions, the conditions being one, the site shall be developed in accordance with the plans as prepared by Khalil Architects, submitted as part of application PZ193790. The plans are deemed as being incorporated by reference herein. Two, drawings showing opening dimensions, a window and door schedule, dimensioned and scaled profile sections of the proposed new windows and doors, and colour manufacturers, brochures and or colour catalogue photographs of the proposed new windows and doors shall be submitted to staff for review. Three, detailed specifications and a manufacturer's brochure or colour photograph of the proposed railing shall be submitted to staff for review. Four, the proposed colour of the driveway and what wave pavers shall be specified. Five, detailed specifications and a colour manufacturer's brochure and or colour photographs shall be submitted for all proposed walls, fences and gates. Six, a certificate to dig shall be required during the permitting phase for all ground disturbing work. Seven, the resolution shall be included in the master permit set. Eight, the applicant shall comply with all applicable requirements of the Miami 21 Code and Chapter 17 and Chapter 23 of the City of Miami Code of Ordinances 
Nine, the applicant shall comply with the requirements of all applicable departments, agencies, as part of the City of Miami building permit submittal process. Um, I also have um, a couple of um, emails and a letter from the Spring Garden Neighbourhood Association. Can I read them into the record? Yes, please. Um, Okay, I'm having a problem here minimizing the screen because of the I'm having a problem minimizing my screen, I think, because of the um sharing of the screen. Okay. No, nope, this is still in full screen mode for me. Okay, that's better, thank you. Okay, the first correspondence I want to read is just opening. And this is from the Spring Garden Civic Association. The applicant was advised at length to reach out to the association all through the design process. Um, and this is a letter I received from the association. Um, the board of the Spring Garden Civic Association met with the owner, Sharon Castrillon, and the architect in a Zoom meeting last Thursday to review for the first time the plans for the residents at this site. We welcome the opportunity, as many invitations for such a meeting have been proffered but not accepted. The most recent last January the 5th, over five months ago. There are a number of design elements that are reflective of the original supporting structure and are welcome in our historic district. We agree with many of the conditions outlined by the preservation officer and commend the officer for thorough attention to detail. We would like to have a second and or continuing opportunity to work with the owner and architect to further confer regarding several issues which we see as integral to full consensus. First, a more extensive landscape plan, which provides for native landscaping and which includes a mature oak tree between the front elevation and the sidewalk, height approximately 20 to 30 feet. Second, a roofline pitch, which pays homage to the original structure, is a key visual curbside element. A flat roofline defines a different decade, even a different century. Third, the guidelines for wall fence structures limits height to five feet at the sidewalk and to five feet on side property lines to one feet behind the front elevation. Horizontal slats should be replaced with vertical pickets, which could be fabricated to resemble the wood picket fences of the era or the original contributing structure. We are well aware that property owners may come and go, but the structures left behind are with us forever. We put great emphasis on any new construction adding to the historic district designation, particularly when the site involved was home to a contributing structure for our original designation. The HEC board denied the request for demolition and the previous owner appealed successfully to the City Commission for demolition. The rebuild plan was reflective of the original structure updated to current code compliance. Thanks for your support, Carol Boynton, Vice President, Spring Garden Civic Association. The next one that I have is a letter of support from Anna Pedroza. Dear Mr. Adams, my name is Anna Pedroza, resident of Spring Garden. Please receive this email as my opinion for tomorrow's HEC board meeting. I am the neighbour of the above referenced property. I've seen the project recently as it was presented to me. I believe that this proposed property scale and use of open areas for greenery will blend in beautifully with the community of Spring Garden. Please submit my vote in favour of approving the construction of this home. And the final one is from Dave Park. Um, he basically just attached the letter from the um, Civic Association and his message said, Hi everyone, I called Carlos earlier today to indicate my vote was a no. So they are the three that I have received and I believe you all have a copy of the public comment from Carlos Salas. Um, who I believe is the president of the Neighbourhood Association. Yes. Okay. Um, applicant, do you have anything to add to the staff report? 
Yes, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yes, okay. Uh, if you'd like, I could go over my actual presentation, which was reviewed by staff uh, as well. But just to reemphasize with the meeting that happened uh, last week with the neighborhood, of, with the Spring Garden Association. Um, that I can tell, I believe the only member of Spring Garden that was there in that meeting was Carlos. And we had, uh, sorry, we just lost you again. I'm oh, sorry, can you hear me now? No. Now? Can you hear me? Not well. Not well? That's better. Okay, a little better here. Maybe if I go a little further away. I'll move to this. Um, so we had that meeting, the meeting last week with Spring Garden Association. Uh, and, and as I mentioned in that letter, yeah, the last time they reached out was in January before we finished our redesign of the project, which is why we never reached out. And when we got news that uh, uh, that they're reaching out to us, I was informed by Mr. M Mr. Adams and my client, Ms. Catrion. We then we shot and we had our meeting a couple of weeks later, which was last week. And then I can tell that meeting went very well. Um, one of the members, uh, it was neighbors and I think just people generally interested in the project. Uh, and for the most part, they were in favor. They were happy to see that we actually created more greenery on the landscape, especially compared to the original design. And not everyone there had seen the previous design, uh, but they were very much in favor of the spacing. And one of the biggest points of contention, uh, which has a which I agreed with them, was placing a larger tree, a more mature and maybe more native species, on the front of the property. Because uh, you can see my screen also, right? I believe I had a, it was just in the conversation, I believe we stated that we should, on the front of the property, in this area here, put something more mature to something similar to what the original residents had, which was uh, live oak in this area, which we were not against. Uh, as to the question of the maturity of the tree, that was in question. I think that a a uh, sixteen foot tree uh, at planting is plenty that will grow over time with the residents as well. Uh, just to go over the design, I don't, uh, I don't know if uh, I know a few of you board members were there in the original presentation, which was a completely different design than the residents that you're seeing in front of you here. Uh, Mr. Adams went through most of the points that were significant, but I'll go over the uh, the points that were mentioned in the last meeting to see how we resolve said issues. Um, so this is a new uh, modern inspired residence that does draw a lot of its uh, inspiration from what was originally there. Uh, let's skip ahead to the presentation. That's a landscape plan. So point by point. Uh, we went over the form of the residence, and we this is the original historic structure here on the right. And we did our best to actually study the existing forms of the residence, such as the main residence to the right, the uh, further portion to the left, the carport here on the left. Uh, I'm sorry, the, I'm sorry, uh, Eddie, to break up your your, your sure, conversation. Sure. Um, is anybody else seeing a uh, presentation? I'm not seeing anything. No, I can't see anything either. Oh, you can't see? Oh. Yeah. I can't see anything Wait. either. I had my screen shared. I guess it unshared for a second. In a second. Let me see if I can do this again. Thank you for bringing it up. There we go. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, great. So, again, uh, so this is the, uh, if you haven't seen the actual residence, here's just a cover sheet with some, and we'll get back to the actual uh, front elevation renders again when we continue. This being the front, this is being the rear, and this being one of the two sides, and the other side is further in the presentation. So one of the, one of the points of contention was uh, adding, you know, replacing this purple queen, which uh the spring garden uh members that were there in last week's presentation and the neighbors that were 
involved, including uh, Emmett Moore from the Dade Heritage Trust was there, and he spoke very favorably of the project as well. And uh, he uh, and, and we all discussed, you know, specifically this tree for, for a little bit, just to, just to see what we place here. And we all agreed that a live oak may work better here. And this is something that we will change in the working documents as we all agreed on that. Uh, with everything else, with the rights of the landscape and the green area, they were very much in favor of the, of the fact that we uh, reduced significantly the ground area cover that we had from the original design and that we very much respected um, the green space and front setbacks so that there's less sort of, a, of an impact from the pedestrian street. Moving ahead to the uh, analysis with regard to uh, historic criteria. The form of the residence is something that we, we analyzed with in comparing to the original residence. So the original residence had this, what you're seeing here, green form B, red form A being the carport, the opening for the carport, the blue being the horizontal lintel uh, for the roof of the carport, and C being the mass beyond. We studied this form and we essentially created, here we're seeing it more close, we, we basically tried to respect those forms and proportions from the original residence and creating the same or similar B form for the main mass of the structure, A being very similar for the carport and entrance, the blue horizontal uh, lintel, and C, although our mass is larger than the original residence, it still has the same, uh, it, it's conceptually, it still follows with respect to the original design, and that's a much further uh, massing towards the rear left. With regard to rhythm and pattern, that's something that we studied with the actual windows and openings. So again, we went back with the carport opening, very similar to the to what we are proposing, uh, in that it's broken up with even a, a vertical column element here, and the same kind of pattern here with the two openings. And one of the comments from the last meeting was that our windows in the original design had multiple forms and didn't really follow any specific rhythm. So we studied the original residence and saw which what kind of rhythm they followed. And it's basically, we, we follow something similar with the actual uh, openings and we repeated it throughout the residence because even though the historic residence had, you know, besides the front facade, they had multiple sizes of openings on the side and rear, uh, we decided to keep the, what you're seeing here is a one-to-one -one pattern uh, for the, for basically all the openings of the residence, ignoring, of course, the main uh, entrance of the residence. Um, so on the side, you're seeing the one-to-one -one pattern, which we repeated. The actual fenestrations are the same, even though the pattern within are different. We believe that the the difference in the actual pattern within the fenestrations uh, give movement to the eye as you're looking at the residence and making it seem even, uh, making it less stagnant as a design. So again, we repeated on the side of the residence that one-to-one -one pattern within and similar fenestrations throughout and introduced a third uh, pattern three. And on the other side of the residence, the same concept with the one to one patterns and similar openings. Uh, the rear, and this is a comparison on the rear of a residence because here we're seeing multiple types of openings on the original historic residence where we tried to at least keep the concept of, because it did have the concept of a larger opening toward the rear, we kept that idea except we repeated a pattern throughout that rear of the residence as well. Uh, we did a quick analysis of what can be done with regard to a hip roof house in this zone to show that the height could be significantly or at least seem significantly taller than what we are proposing. So in scale and proportion, our residence is actually, uh, our proposed residence is much more subtle and less visually striking than what could be. And that was one of the conversations that I had with the uh, neighbors that appeared in the meeting last week for Spring Garden, that although a uh, the vernacular that we chose is one specific to uh, the vernacular that uh, our client and uh, we discussed and decided that would be something more suited, most suited for her, uh, the vernacular has 
or could have very little to do with respect to uh, the historic neighborhood or the historic district. Uh, that was one of the conversations that I had with the board because they asked me why this, specific, this specific vernacular to which I mentioned to them, uh, you could propose a hip roof house, a shed roof house, a gable den house. It doesn't matter what kind of roof you actually decide upon. Uh, it's the actual, the actual representation of what, or the actual respect of a historic neighborhood or proportions and scale and form of what was there prior or any other residents within the area actually has to do with more beyond what kind of roof you have in your residence. As a matter of fact, you can actually propose different roof and roof types that are with complete disrespect to what was there prior or with the actual neighboring area. So even though a hip roof could have been proposed at maximum height of the property, it could have been with disrespect to what was actually proposed uh, by us. Let me see. So, and here we're actually analyzing the open space of the uh, memory properties. And we'll see this here and we'll also see it in the uh, side elevations, uh, the rendered side elevations. So we propose a significant area of open space, including the deck as Mr. Adams mentioned that half the rear yard is green space and the other half is open deck and pool. But with regard to open, it still feels, it still gives it that open feel. Uh, in order to give respect to the neighbors, you'll see it more on the side elevation that we have, you know, lower areas to certain parts of the residence. And we created, especially for this neighbor, we created an open courtyard area so, so as to break up the massing on this elevation. And although this specific area here is part of the covered space, this is the carport, therefore would even still feel as an open space viewed from the street and viewed from the neighboring property. And that is actually the uh, the elevation that we decided to focus on because although we do have, you know, this is the longer part of the residence that we have, but we actually decided to uh, maximize even more green type areas by creating lower planters on the ground area, planter on top of the carport and a planter on the roof terrace as well. So as to increase the uh, visual foliage on the property. And of course, we decreased the main setback of the building. We increased it from 30 feet, from 20 feet to uh, 30 feet, seven inches to the actual main building. And the porch and carport area is at 24 three, which is still more than the minimum of, uh, I believe the front setback is 20 feet plus another eight feet in allowed encroachment for porches, which we, again, we increased all the setbacks to give it just more foliage and more green space. Um, if you wanted to see some zoning information really quickly, just to see the square footages, the maximum covered area that we are proposing for the lot coverage is we are proposing 2,958 square feet, where we are allowed basically almost 3,500. So we're about 540-ish square feet under what we are allowed for the ground floor. On the last presentation, we almost maximized that. So that's something that the owner and I redesigned the residents completely in order to respect the green space significantly. And moving to the actual elevations and materials, as you'll see here. We use a lot of horizontal elements in order to emphasize this horizontality and not emphasize any sort of height and to uh, pay homage to the smooth stucco siding uh, to the uh, yeah to the stucco siding or the wood siding I'm sorry from the original residence with our with our horizontal stucco siding and again we repeated it with the carport with the patterns repeated once more the green space is even more emphasized even though the driveway uh, with the driveway being of impervious material And with the side elevation, one of the side elevations, this is the one that I was telling you that has the big open courtyard space here. Although you'll see a beam connecting the residence as far as aesthetic, it's actually this being a large hole here where she would plant, eventually plant more of a shrubbery or bamboo type tree in this area just to add to the green space. And on the side, another planter just to add more foliage to the residence. And the rear facade, it would remain relatively open and set back significantly to the rain residence. 
and the other side elevation with a lot of foliage uh, on the, again, the planter that we discussed earlier and the planter on top of the carport and on the rear terrace. Uh, if you have any, uh, if you have any questions with regard to our presentation, oh, and the owner also, I don't know if you can see me, but she wanted to show, uh, it's not a, the greatest copy, but she actually, Ms. Castellon actually went around the neighborhood and presented or showed a presentation of the project uh, to multiple neighbors and had a, a lot of neighbors actually sign in approval of the residents. I know it's hard to see, but she just had it to, to me now. It's a photocopy of her presentation that she had. Uh, but that's all. Uh, oh, no, no. Sorry, Ms. Castrillon was asking me if she wanted me to have her speak. Uh, but if you guys have any questions with regard to the design and to what we tried to accomplish on it, uh, feel free to ask me any questions. Okay, thank you. Can you okay. stop sharing your screen now and we'll- Sure thing, sure, sure, yes. Thanks. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Was, was this information included in our packet or um, accessible online? If you're asking me, I, I don't know. This is what was no, submitted I, to I was actually ask, I was asking staff. Oh, okay. Uh, the application is uploaded to the agenda. Right, but is this most recent plan set included in that? Um, whatever he submitted last is included. I'm not sure. Because I, I was going through and I and I I wanted to be able to see the updated drawings before the meeting, and I had, only time I have seen that um, was uh, on your actual application for an with one image, like a proposed design image. But I I I, I have not seen the plans until just now. I don't know if it's just me. Mr. Khalil, are, are the drawings that you showed there, are they different from the ones that you submitted with the application? No, that was exactly what was submitted. Um, they, they should all be there then. Way back when. I have the same problem. I don't see what he was showing on the screen downloaded. I see all the other previous designs, but not this one. Right. Yes. And one question I have just to follow up on this. So the um, association had sent a letter um, supporting the uh, staff's recommendation for denial, but now the staff's not recommending denial. Is there an updated report or a letter from the association? I, I checked that with hearing boards. I'm not sure why that was done, but for this particular project, the, the staff recommendation was for approval. Uh, I'm not sure why the agenda showed denial, but the, the, the recommendation was for approval with those conditions. Let's the updated staff analysis is is on the agenda. It says uh, right. updated for 2020. So my question though is, there's um, the homeowners association has still says that it supports staff's approval for or staff's recommendation for denial. And so what I'm curious is not only are we not seeing the updated plans, but has the homeowners association seen the updated plans and do they continue to either uh, advocate denial or are they now more in agreement and advocating a support of staff's recommendations? If I may, um, that was, I emailed the homeowners, of the Spring Garden Association, exactly this presentation that I just showed you now, which was also what was submitted to the city of Miami. And that was what was discussed uh, last week where Mr. Adams read that they were mostly in favor uh, with some comments on, on pitch roof. Uh, the, but I'm sorry, Mr. Adams, go ahead. The letter I received from them, I only received yesterday. And I also spoke to Mr. Salas today. And he said that, yes, the neighborhood does want to work with the applicants, even though they are maybe not 100% convinced with the design. They want to show that they are working with the applicants. However, the concerns that they included in the letter basically stand. So 
they want to work with the applicant, they want to support the applicant. They do have some concerns that I read out in the letter, and I believe that's why they requested a continuance to allow them to work further with right. them. So the November 5th, 2019 letter that uh, Spring Garden Civic Association Board sent, that there's been a lot of, or, or there's been additional uh, presentation by the applicant and, and communication with the association? Because this one says clearly, uh, they uphold staff report by the preservation officer for denial of certificate of appropriateness. And it's dated November 5th, 2019. So I, I, I think what it is, is I think what it is, we just didn't get the most recent information within the packet that was submitted. We didn't get the updated plan set that, that um, Eduardo Khalil just presented, and we didn't get um, any of the stuff that was read um, right. earlier from Warren. Because I guess my point is, what I'm seeing, and this is for the first time that uh, the architect's presenting, looks much better than what was original. And I, I imagine um, they worked closely with staff for staff to reverse or to change their um, recommendation. But I, since we don't have it in front of us, and I'm trying to see um, context and your rendered images, not just um, uh, construction documents, and, and then also an update on what the association's position is. So based yeah, on that. I, I, I agree, I agree with you, Todd, because I, I also am feeling the same sort of, uh, I only saw what we saw for 30 seconds and then we don't have an ability to kind of contrast it to its neighborhood or, or, the, or the prior drawings. So I, I would perhaps suggest that we continue this and let, let them catch up, let the um, applicant have that further uh, communication with the association whatever they, they come back, but come back. So we do have a full set with us. I see rendered elevations. I prefer to see more contextual, um, even if it's uh, inserted in photos of the uh, neighborhood and to, to get a better idea for the context. But I will commend the uh, architect, the analysis that they're doing and trying to, um, evaluate and then reinterpret the uh, composition was there that's certainly in the right direction uh hi this is chris can i say something yes go ahead um yeah i would like to commend the architect as well i thought again the package that i have in front of us uh here is dated from last year so i know we're not looking at the most current drawings based on the drawings that were just provided with the colored elevations uh the one thing that I would say, and I think this goes along maybe with the letter that was provided by the uh, homeowners association, is that looking at the massing along the sides of the res residence, um, definitely, I think that you know there needs to be some additional landscape, I and mean, there's not much room there. But even like narrow palms or something like that to help bring the two-story volumes into scale with the adjacent properties, because right now you just have a property line, then a very large volume. And on one portion of the property, then now you have pavers that are going along the side. So in a situation like this, if there was nothing that you could do, I would think that maybe you could introduce vines on the side of the residence, but I don't think that's necessarily the best move here. I just think that if you study the elevation, I think that the landscape plan needs to be updated as per the HOA. I don't think there's anything wrong with having a 20 foot oak tree in the front of the property. There's not much difference. I think that it'll help uh, in the long run. And then I think that the elevations need to reflect some additional landscape on the sides so that the residence doesn't appear to just be, uh, you know, um, out of scale. Now, as Mr. Tregash mentioned, maybe that has to do with the fact that we didn't see um, drawings that show the context of this volume in relationship to what's happening next door. And maybe that it's next door to really uh, heavily vegetated properties and that could have to do with it. But um, I definitely think it's heading in the right direction. And uh, those are my comments. Thank you. Yeah, from, from my side, just to reiterate what I was saying earlier um, and to echo what Todd was saying, um, you know, I only have one image for the proposed design, which is what I, what, what I find within the, um, the application. Um, the rest of the content, it's difficult to process. I mean, 
Eddie gave a great presentation, and I think the um, the direction that it's, it has head in is, is is much better. And contextually, in regards to its historical significance and sampling from the past project, all of that story that's there is, is great. Um, just need a little bit more time to look at it and understand what 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 it is. So. Um, I think the suggestion timing was a good one. Maybe that gives everyone time to review us time because we actually would get to look at it prior to the presentation, which I think is the way it should go anyway. Um, and also from the homeowners homeowners association um, to allow them to uh, to review as well. So, Jordan, just to clarify, you guys didn't have access to this to this presentation. You saw the old presentation, no. right? And and one image, yeah. Of uh, the only time we've we've been able to see your updated presentation is, is when you just presented it um, on the uh, on 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 the city website where you download um, the portal where you download information that, that information wasn't there. Oh. If I may, uh, the owner Ms. Catrion uh, would like to say something. Okay, she's been listening in the other room because I have the headset on. So. Hi. Hi, how are you? Can you hear me? Yes, please give your name and address uh, for the record. Uh, Sharon Custodian, 713 Northwest 7th Street Road. Thank you. Hi, I'm the owner of the property. Um, I just wanted to make a couple comments because I heard uh, Mr. Cawley, um, the comments that you were talking about what the uh, association had discussed in November what were comments that were directed towards the first project, not the second project. Um, when we did meet with the Spring Garden Civic Association, we did the same screen sharing. So they did see the updated project. Um, the first project uh, we had discussed with them too, but the second project they were uh, screen sharing. So they were seeing all of this. Uh, for the most part, everyone with the Spring Garden Civic Association was on board. One of, I think their main concerns was uh, one of the trees in the front, which today is called a purple tree, they wanted it to be a live oak tree, a big live oak tree, which we decided, yes, we were going to put a big live, live oak tree, and that's something we'll do. Um, but for the most part, everybody was on board with the project. Everybody in the meeting was. Um, beyond that, I decided to go to Spring Gardens and go neighbor by neighbor, and I met all of my neighbors, and I went, there's 230 plus houses in Spring Garden, and I went with my mom and my kids on a weekend, and I spent the whole weekend knocking door to door, and I ended up getting signatures from everybody um, in approval of this new design. Everybody loved it, everybody was in favor of it, they thought it would tie in very well. With the oh, we just lost you again. No. Hello? No. Hello? 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 No. Hello? 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 Testing, testing. Hello? That's better. Oh, okay. It's better. Um, so, uh, I don't know what part you got cut off on, but um, I spent uh, an entire weekend with my mother and my children. We walked to 200 plus houses in Spring Garden because um, the Spring Garden Civic Association, just um, if you know or, or don't know, it's not actually a homeowners association of the area. It's not actually of of the people um in those houses some people are actually from outside there's no association fees there's no it's just a group of people that have gotten together um they are the supposed opinion of 230 people that lived in spring gardens they don't have meetings they don't have annual meetings they don't have minutes they don't have anything like that because i've asked i've asked i try i wanted to go to the meetings i wanted to be a participant if I live in Spring Gardens. They said that that's not available to me. That's not affordable to me because um, it, it doesn't work like that. So I decided, well, if they represent the voice of the people, 
I'm better off going to see the actual people. So I went to 200 plus houses and I got all the signatures. I would say around close to 200 signatures of everybody in approval of this property, of this new design. Uh, we worked hard to change it to fit in. It looks exactly like a house from Spring Garden. And I think it does a lot of justice. Um, the fact that the, the property is not online for you, I don't know if that's something that Mr. Adams could upload while we're still in the conversation. Um, but it's something I, I, I met with Mr. Adams numerous times. I bothered him a lot. I'm very sorry. But uh, I really worked hard with my architect to going back and forth, spent a lot of money to, to, to redesign. Um, and it's just something I, I really would like to uh, move forward on. It's, you know, as it, as it stands, it might take between a year to two years to build a property. So, I mean, it's something that I've been working on for more than a year, spending a lot of money, working hard with the neighbors. Um, the, you have an email from Ana Pedrosa. She's the exact neighbor next door. She will be, let's say, the most impacted by the property. And she loves the design. She loves it. She thinks it's beautiful. She thinks it'll fit in well. The other neighbor, George, he is a veterinarian in Kendall that comes from Canada. I know him as well. I know the other one, Bobby, next door. I know everybody already in Spring Gardens. Um, I know of all these people, there's two architects that live there, and they love the design. Brill Hart, who just, Melissa Brill Hart, she just sold her property there. She loved the design as well. And um, another one, uh, John Brevard, who also has a des uh, designed house there. He loves the property too. Um, I think it's very uh, historical. It matches very um, significantly to the house that was there before. It pays homage to that and it respects the spring gardens. So um, I just, I wanted to really push to see if we can if we could maybe show any questions you guys have with the with the project. And, and if you wanted to look at the design more, we could split the screen again. Um, Mr. Andrade, you had a question, you had your hand up. Yes, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I had two questions. Uh, the first question relates to um, this association or is there anyone present on their behalf um, right now, um, I guess on this Zoom meeting that we can hear from? No, I believe they were here only through their uh, written comments. Okay. Um, and then my other question relates to, um, apparently the, the applicant submitted their, um, their paperwork and, and their designs um, through the city's portal um, and, and I guess not, none of us have been able to access that. I'm just wondering, um, you know, where did the, uh, who dropped the ball there, if you will, how, how did that happen? How does it not happen in the future? Um, is it the applicant's fault? Is it not, not necessarily trying to pin blame on anyone, just making sure, um, that we don't deal with a similar situation again, because I think applicants put in a lot of time and, um, effort and um are paying professionals um and they, i guess you know have an expectation that whatever they're uploading into the city's portal um is made available for all of us so that we can make a decision so i don't know if that's a question to i don't probably not the chair but perhaps mr adams or her staff um, um i don't know can hearing boards um can do you know what, what happened? Um, hearing boards wasn't aware of any new documents except for your staff analysis, which was uploaded. Move this out of the way. So um, the our notary is also the uh, expediter for the project. And hold on. Oh, she wants to. You want to pay? Sure. Give your name and address for the record. Give your name and address for the record first, please. Jessica Coyasso, seven. 730, 730, 713, Northwest 7th Street. That's your address? Oh, my address. I'm so sorry. 291 Southwest 48th Court. 
Core Gables, Florida, 33134. Okay. I personally took the plans to the city and they scanned them themselves. It's what we did. They uploaded it back in March 5th, to be exact. So it's um, April, May, June. So it's three and a half months later. No other way, Mr. And yes. for some reason, the plans didn't didn't make it to, to the board members. I'm just sort of trying to understand got, what happened. It got, I took it personally to the city. It got uploaded by them. Once Adam even reviewed it and gave us his comments and review on it, what happened from there, I, I'm totally... Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm sorry. I wasn't asking you the question. I guess uh, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm try, I guess I'm trying to ask staff. Just it, it, it sounds like they submitted their application over three months ago or the revised plans at this point, um, and no one has seen them. I'm um, just trying to log into... E plan at the moment, and um, if you give me a couple of minutes, I can check. Sure, sure. In the meantime, I have a question for the architect. Yes. I noticed you had. Uh, Planters, oh, I have two questions. One mm -hmm. with respect to the planters on top of the carport. Sure. It's not clear what you were planting in there and how they were going to get watered. Uh, so that's something that I was in, I was uh, communicating with my landscape architect. Uh, she wasn't sure what kind of plants to put there yet. At the moment, we were proposing vines, and that's something we're going to discuss further in the uh, actual permit construction document sets because what she usually does for we've worked with Laura Yerena who's our landscape architect for many years and what and we've done roof type planters before and what she usually proposes is a drip system uh you know, drip sprinkler systems it's just over time just little by little uh waters the plants in that area which would be selected as a native species uh, up there and the yeah. second question is what is a purple queen that's another native tree that was recommended by again by my landscape architect and uh that's the one that the uh it's a native species a native tree Do you have a scientific uh, name uh yes it should be i don't know if she put it in the I in the uh presentation i didn't see it hey guys this is chris it's actually a little ground cover that goes on the ground that's what I saw on pictures. Yeah, I didn't like I didn't like the tree after uh, on further inspection because they actually recommended it to us because I asked her my my let's go back there for a flowering tree. She told me that's a good native species that could either grow as a tree or it can grow as you know kind of a shrub mix like a bougainvillea. And no, uh, that's and that's the one that we that's the one that we that's the one that we decided to replace uh, with a live oak instead because a live oak seems more fitting for the environment and it doesn't seem as shrubby as a purple tree is we're losing we're losing you again i'm sorry Did you, can you hear me can you hear me i hear you now okay but yeah that's that's the tree that we planned on replacing with the live oak because the live oak seems more fitting of a tree for this neighborhood and for this location because i agreed with uh i agreed with everyone when they stated that this tree may be more shrubby like a bougainvillea than a uh, larger uh, shade tree, which would be better for this neighborhood. Chris? I was just going to say um, thanks a lot for that clarification. I think the really the big deal is just the massing of the residents and where you put a tree, you know, and how it all kind of fits together. I thought when I saw a landscape plan real quick, they were everything was kind of pushed over to the edge. And I think that if you just kind of study the placement within the landscape so that this residence just appears to be from the, you know, part of the place as opposed to right in the middle and all the plantings are at the perimeters or whatever, I think that's almost just as important. Does that make sense? It's more about just studying what you've already done and, and tweaking it a little bit and adjusting some of the species to be more native, just being a little bit more naturalistic and a, and a little bit less kind of landscape design so the, does that make sense so, the, uh, so the landscape plan is something that's still in working because uh right. one of the things as you saw in our 
what we're presented in our in our uh, renderings is a little bit closer, and I don't know if you want me to go back to that, uh, but we actually have a courtyard space on one of the sides. That's why we create a large opening specifically to put a medium-sized tree that with medium growth in that area. Uh, and uh, and on the rear yard, one of the proposals that I've been telling Sharon is that I would like a larger tree in the back as well. On the side yards, uh, when we discussed it with the Spring Garden neighbors, when we had the meeting last week, they were all happy that we actually increased the side setbacks of the residents and we tried to maximize uh, landscape area and green space as much as possible, even creating an opening on an already difficult site on one of the facades. Um, so that's something that we very much took into consideration. And as you mentioned, Mr. Colley, uh, that the possibility of actually having some of these planters have like a type of ivy type vine growing on the side from the planter down is something that is very feasible and would further soften a facade that's already uh, become softened with uh, the landscape area. That sounds great. Thanks very much, Mr. Khalil. I think it's really heading totally in the right direction. Mr. Adams, were you able to find anything? Yes, the updated documents are in ePlan. Um, I can only assume they weren't uploaded because they were uploaded under a different name from the original documents. Amended documents should be uploaded with exactly the same name so that they are layered over the first submittal. So if you have A1 site plan, any amended document should also be called A1 site plan and it would form a version two over the version one and only the um, most updated documents will be uploaded. Um, I don't know if hearing boards can confirm. Is it because they were named differently that they were, they didn't get uploaded? Well, yeah, somebody needs to let us know that there are updates. If a application has already gone, I wouldn't know if there's an update or not unless somebody tells me. When were they uploaded? Yes. Um, Mr. Khalil, um, I guess you should let your client know. I don't know who's uploading these documents. It sounded like the uh, the young lady. It was the actual city of Miami. That's back in March and February, like uh, similar, exactly, actually, not similar, exactly how we uploaded the first presentation last year back in, I believe we uploaded the beginning of October for the November presentation. We did the same method in that we physically took it to the city of Miami. They physically scanned it there, and it was the responsibility of City of Miami to actually name it at that point, because we have two options. Either we upload them digitally and name the files ourselves, or we take it to the city, and they do that process for us for a fee, and we pay them the fee, and they actually upload all the documents themselves to avoid an error like we're seeing right now. All right, well, it sounds like based on some of the comments from, from the board members that they're you may end up having to do a few more revisions. So you probably want to make sure that, <coughs> excuse me, um, that you square away this uploading issue so that at the next meeting, um, we actually have everything that we need to review and, and can avoid uh, a similar situation. What I, would suggest, what I would suggest is when you upload them, drop me an email and I will go in and double check the system and make sure everything is there and as it should be. And I will work with hearing boards to make sure that all the correct information is uploaded. So who has a motion for today? Uh, if, I'm, if I may, one more second. Uh, yes, sir. I would like to speak one more time. Go ahead. Hold on a second. Sure. Hello? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hi. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that um, uh, we've worked very hard, very long on this project. Um, and the thing is, is I don't think that I should be punished for something that wasn't our fault. Uh, we submitted it appropriately in March. Uh, it's the only way Mr. Adams would have gotten a copy. It was submitted in March, a lot, many months ago. Um, and this is something I've just worked really hard on. My, my family's stressed, I'm stressed. You know, and it's been way too long. It's been a year. Um, Mr. Mr. Adams, who is the preservation officer, has 
suggested has recommended approval. Um, all of the neighbors have recommended approval. This project is is very in you know in line with what Spring Garden you know is, and I just uh, you know there there was one gentleman in the Spring Garden Civic Association, which again is not really an association that wants a bigger yeah it's just one gentleman carlos who he wants a bigger tree we've said okay his letter states that he's discussed with us about putting a live oak tree i've said okay um if we can do an approval with the contingency of putting this live oak tree into the plants i mean that's something then you know we satisfy everybody Mr. Mr. Warren Adams has suggested approval. Um, all the Spring Gardens people have suggested that it gets approved. I've worked hard with my architect. We redesigned the entire thing from the ground up. I, and I just don't think that I should be punished for something that we had submitted in March appropriately. I just, yeah, if you look at the design, the front of it, it gives homage to spring gardens and um it's just something that i i think should get approved and i would just like you guys to consider that but can, do you guys have any questions for me not at this time i, I see two people's hands up uh mr andrade i see your hand first But you're going to have to unmute yourself. Yeah, there we go. I'm sorry. Um, if a motion were to be made um, to approve the project um, consistent with staff's recommendation and either doesn't get a second or fails, um, I guess a, a secondary motion can then be made um, to continue it um, to the following month or, or whenever. I mean, it would not be fatal to the project. If the motion failed to pass it, like it, that's correct. Unless it was a motion to deny. Okay. The motion to approve and it failed, it would not prejudice. Okay. It. Well, you know what? I'm sympathetic to uh, the homeowner. It sounds like this has been going on for um, for quite some time, um, and I would make a motion to approve the uh, project with um, consistent with staff's recommendation. Thank you. With thank the, you, thank you. With the uh, conditions set forth in the staff report? Yes, sir. Is there a second to Mr. Mr. Andrade's motion? If you do, you're gonna to have to unmute yourself. Okay, not seeing a second at the moment. Well, that motion fails for lack of a second. There's someone else who had their hand up. And of course, in the course of the civil rights era and, and objection to Brown v. Board of Education and school integration. Someone else with their hand up? I'm thinking, so to me, okay, is there a, is there a second motion? In the context to understand when people talk about these monuments as if they're our heritage history. I'll make a motion. Um, motion to continue this um, to next hearing. And um, I do want to convey uh, with this motion, I'm very empathetic for the resident. I think this, uh, all these events really are not uh, uh, any responsibility of the applicant and, and or her uh, architect. But I do think it's important that you're, you've had some excellent feedback there's a lot of uh, uh, positive comment from board members saying this is the right direction. Um, we're not denying that uh, your, your efforts to go to uh, the homeowners, uh, each and every one of them, and to get that support, that's, that's very good. And so all I can just say is we're going through a little bit of a uh, uh, learning curve here with these, uh, these hearings and with the the digital uh, format and just um, don't get discouraged. 
um, it's it's um, moving in the right right direction and just bear bear with the process and and one more month out of all the time and effort you put in um, I think you'll you're still going to be um, uh, moving forward with the project Mr. Trago, just if I could ask one moment, one moment. Um, before I ask for a second uh, is, what is the date for our next year and United States of America, do you want to compare Mr. Adams or Ms. Alvarez? Can we get them onto the July the July meeting if they up if they make amendments? Um no, the deadline's over for that one. The next one would be September first. Oh, Even if this was continued. July. I wouldn't. I wouldn't need any new documents like today. By the end of the day. If that's the case, I would suggest though that you have the documents that just need to be um, updated on the uh, on the website. Could I? Could I just ask a question? Is it? Is it just because we need the documents uploaded again? I mean, they're already on the, the City of Miami's portal. Um, is it just because it needs to be submitted? And it's because the board has not had an opportunity to look at them. So the okay. board needs to look at them in order to vote. Okay. Since they have been submitted in March, is it possible I could be continued for the July meeting? Because That's what we're going to try. Give me a second. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, if, yeah, if I already have the documents, then that's fine. Okay. If that's fine with you, Warren. That's fine with me. Yeah, the, the July meeting is July 7th? July 7th. July 7th. So Mr. Craig's motion is to continue this to continue this item to the July 7th meeting to allow the applicant documents which have already been submitted to be uploaded so that the board can take a look at them. Is that correct, Mr. Trey Gash? That's correct. And even going a little further that um, if uh, since this is a carryover from this agenda, that it could be at the front of the next next agenda. Good point. Is there a second to Mr. Trey Gash's motion? Second. Second. Ms. O'Dell? Yes, second. Thank you. Any discussion just, on the motion? Um, just a reminder, when voting and roll call, please have your video and audio on. Mr. Chair, I would just like to clarify um, one thing. Then turn it off. Yes, sir. Um, I just want to make sure that the applicant um, and staff are on the same page and the board, everyone is on the same page that whatever documents are, are currently existing in the portal um, is sufficient to proceed at the July meeting so that we don't have a repeat of this um, come July. There are no other documents that need to be uploaded or submitted that would um, create sort of the same situation next month. Is what, that correct? What I would like to, as the maker of the motion, add one document to that, and that's the um, signatures that she's received over the uh, the past few weeks or months. That that would have to be done to deal, Beatrice. Yeah. What was that? That has to be done today. She said uh, yes, I have it. I'll email it to you, Mr. Adams. Perfect. If you want that? Um, Beatrice, can you confirm that I can upload it under current circumstances? Um, I'm not sure. We'll get it one way or another. Under current circumstances, I'll do what I can to get it uploaded for you. Worst case scenario, as long as I have a copy, I'm happy to speak on the record and say this is the document that we have and we have X amount of signatures in support of it. One way or the other, we'll get it into the record for you. Amber, Amber's here now. Amber? Who's Amber? She can speak to this, I would think. Yes. yes. Um, in regard to the signatures being provided as a, as the, in the record? Yes. They can either be one published with the agenda if they're able to get it over to Beatrice today. It can publish with the agenda. If not, it can be submitted to Mr. Warren, uh, Mr. Warren Adams, and he can um, he can make it a part of the record. Submit it to Beatrice 
and um, during the hearing, s send it out to all of the board members and it can be a part of the record in that way. Um, similar to if we were having an in-person meeting at City Hall, somebody can come and pass out a document to be incorporated in the record. So one of those two ways, obviously it's preferable to have it as backup already on the agenda. You guys could see it, examine it um, ahead of time, but if not, there's that other alternative. Thank you. Okay, any other discussion on the motion? Is there a second to the motion? Yes, Ms. Odell, second. Okay. There being no more discussion, let's have a roll call, please. Mr. Tregash? Yes. Ms. Odell? Yes. Mr. Andrade? Yes. Mr. Colley? Yes. Ms. Galvez Dujos? Yes. Mr. Prieto y Munoz? Yes. Mr. Trachtenberg? Yes. Dr. Hopper? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. I'll see you July 7th. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have the applicant from item number one, the lobby, ready to be speaking. Would you like to take, go back to his item? We can swear him in if you can unmute him. There we go. Should be unmuted. Let me in. Take the name for the record. Are they still on the do you swear from the testimony you provide you the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Say I do. I do. Okay. He's sworn in and I have checked his identification. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, do you want to you want to stay there while we hear the item? Yes. Okay. And we'll go back to number one and you can Item number one, file ID 7508, a resolution of the Miami Historic and Environmental Thank you so much. Pursuant to section 23-6.2 of the City Code of Ordinances, approving or denying a special certificate of appropriateness for alterations to a contributing property located approximately 537 Street, Miami, Florida, 33138, within the Palm Grove Historic District. Thank you, and we'll start with these. And the, I'm sorry, the applicant is present and he's given his name already. So we'll start with the staff report. And the applicant is requesting a special COA to allow for alteration to a residential structure. The subject project is a structure within the historic district, part of Baywood, east side net area. And is everyone getting an echo there? Yes, I'm getting the echo. Yeah. See if uh, that's better. I think that's better now. That's better. The subject property is a contributing structure within the Palm Grove Historic District, constructed in 1937. The applicant is proposing to re-roof the structure's hip roof with new asphalt shingles. The original roofing shown in the tax card is concrete tile and the historic photograph shows barrel tile that appears to be incorrectly installed. The applicant has received notice from his homeowner insurance company that they will not renew the policy if the roof is 25 years old or has three years or less of remaining useful life. The current policy will lapse on June 23rd 2020 at 12.01 a.m. Eastern Time, which is um, today. The applicant has submitted a letter claiming financial distress due to economic hardship, which states that the roof had been previously changed to the existing shingle roof and the replacement is in kind to what is in place. The letter further states that the property owners are currently suffering financial distress as both their jobs have been placed on furlough from March 23rd, 2020 through May 20, 2020 because of COVID-19. Section 23-6.2H4A of the code states, where strict enforcement of the provisions of this section would result in an unreasonable or undue economic hardship to the applicant, the board should not have the power to vary or modify the provisions of this section, including adopted guidelines. 
The fact that compliance would result in some increase in costs shall not be considered unreasonable or undue economic hardship if the use of the property is still economically viable. The application has not demonstrated compliance with Chapter 23 entitled Historic Preservation of the City of Miami Code of Ordinances and the Secretary of the Interior Standards. Staff finds the request does not comply with all applicable criteria and finds the request for a special COA for alterations does adversely affect the historic architectural or aesthetic character of the structure and the aesthetic interest or value of the district. Pursuant to section 23-6.2 of the City of Miami Code of Ordinances as amended and the Secretary of the Interior Standard, the Preservation Office recommends denial of the special COA. However, the Board may consider the stated economic hardship claim and the proposed alterations and approve the special certificate of appropriateness. And does the applicant have anything to add to the staff report? Yes, I do. Uh, even though my full lock was until the 22nd of May, now it's been extended until the 31st of July. So we are in a big, you know, economic situation that I can only do what I can. Are there any questions from the board? I would also clarify again that the, the, the architect's homeowner's insurance is um, um, basically run out. And obviously bringing this to the board did take time because of the current situation. So it's, um, it's the current circumstances. Any questions or comments from board members? No. Um, um, this has come up before our board um, cases like this um, often, where there's an alternate material that's less expensive, and it, it is a hardship on on any homeowner to have to uh, spend more money than um, they, they knowing there's a less lesser expensive alternate that meets say the building code requirements. But this is um, the definition of a historic district or contributing buildings are based on the materials that are used in, the, uh, in, each, in each home or in each building. And I think this would set a terrible precedent that you can imagine uh, going down a street with barrel tile roofs and then everyone changing them to asphalt shingles. It would totally um, modify the character, the historic character of that, that street. And um, although um, I understand the uh, homeowner's request, I, I couldn't support this. I think it would be bad policy as, as the, uh, to preserve the historic uh, uh, heritage of, of of this neighborhood. Other comments or questions? Um, question for the owner. Did uh, the alterations that were done on the property now, um, including the, um, the, uh, uh, the impact windows, and the deck and all the other improvements to the property, was that done prior to your ownership? Yes. I bought the house that the way it is. Um, and, and, and those were all done um, through, the, through the historic uh, application process. Is that right, Warren? Uh, uh, I can quickly try and check for you.
so, so while he's checking um, back to the homeowner, um, the issues you're having with the roof, um, is this something that could be patched rather than a full roof replacement? No, they want us to put the whole roof. No patch. Right, no, I, what I'm asking is the issue that you're having with your roof, I'm, I'm assuming it's because you're having leaks. No, I don't. Um, any, the, roof, the roof is perfect. I don't have anything. It's just that the roof, it's over 25 years. So the insurance company that's making so the insurance company is 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 demanding that you replace the roof because of its age. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I see. Mr. Adams, you're on mute. There is a COA application for new fences and gates, um, new off street parking and driveway. So it certainly looks as, as if applications have been have been submitted. That's all the applications I can see at the moment. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Are we ready for a motion? I have a question. Yes, we've got a story. I wanted to ask the applicant if he was aware of the historic district when he purchased the property and when was that district designated? No. No, because the, 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 the historical district is in, is in the other side. So I was not really aware. And I bought the house the way it is. The only thing I put was the fence. And that's it. I haven't done anything else. And it just came out at the end of February that the insurance was asking me that it was not renewed because of the years of the roof. And I said, well, you know, and then COVID-19 came. I mean, the hospitality industry, and it's been very difficult for me. You know? Is there is there any way to get an extension from the insurance company to delay replacing the roof? Not that we try. <laughs> Trust me, we try. Just seems. Um, uh, I just have one one comment um, because I have an older home too and um, an older roof that's that's in good shape. And what the insurance company required from me was. Uh, uh, windstorm mitigation report where uh, a licensed inspector goes out, inspects the roof because they're telling you based on their criteria, there's no useful remaining life in your, of your roof. If you had uh, an inspector, a licensed inspector go out, perhaps they could uh, uh, certify that actually there is, uh, you're, you're saying you're, your uh, roof doesn't leak. It makes well, there, is, uh, there is one in the kitchen. I just got, got mm -hmm. one last week. <laughs> Believe it or not. Yeah, but it just seems um, it needs to be replaced. That it I seems ex it seems extreme that an insurance company would make you replace a whole roof mm -hmm. if it's been there and it's stood the test of time. And what they would require is some sort of certified report stating the condition. And also, have you tried with another homeowner's insurance company no, I haven't. to get it insured? That's what I have. And it was until today. So it's been very, very difficult. You know, even to replace the way they want steal money that I have to take out of my pocket that I wasn't really expecting. You know, it's been very, very difficult. And very unpleasant because I have tried to call so many times and no answer. And then today, finally, I was able to find out and it says expired. I say, oh, wow, they, they really did it. No consideration whatsoever. Right. Mr. Andrade, you had a question. 
Yeah, so just for the applicant, uh, Mr. I guess Laporto. Yeah. Um, just, I'm I'm curious. What what is the the difference in the cost between five thousand dollars? How much? Five thousand dollars. Between the shingles versus and the versus the, the other, it's five thousand dollars. So imagine eight thousand dollars. It's difficult. Imagine thirteen thousand dollars out of my pocket. Um. So my, is, is it possible that you could um, reach out to, um, I guess, someone like one of the other board members? I'm not familiar with all the names yet. Um, you, the guy in the middle um, that spoke before me, Trey, something with a T? Trey Gash. Trey Gash, there you go. Um, he suggested that you might be able to get uh, a wind mitigation uh, report um, that your insurance company might accept. Um, are you saying that's not an option because your policy is expired and they're done with you? They dropped you already? It's already expired. Today at 12.01. Uh, how about contacting another insurance company? Um, well, we were just told it was extended until the end of July. Pardon me? I believe it was the furlough that was extended until the end of July, oh. the applicant's furlough. Right. Okay. Yes. And again, um, these are um, these are different times at the moment. So does that constitute an economic hardship is really what the board has to determine. Um, I think... Um, the fear is setting a precedent of allowing economic hardships. Um, and as the code effectively says, they do have to be treated on a on a case by case basis. Well, uh, I guess whether it's an economic hardship, that that's, I think, a legal question. So um, I would ask legal if it if it meets the legal definition of or case law regarding a hardship. It does. So I apologize. It takes me a little bit to unmute my um, my screen. Um, so I just put up the Chapter 23 provision regarding the economic hardship. Um, it is determined by the board. Um, I, I mean, I, I can help provide some um, uh, guidance and definition and provide the criteria provided in the code. Um, the unreasonable or undue economic hardship. Um, just make sure that I have. Okay, so um, let me just make sure that I'm. I have the right clause here. While you're looking, was were any. Uh, Economic hardship documents filed. As part of the application. I actually did take a look at um, the backup documents that were provided, and it appears that he did provide the um, affidavit um, regarding the assessed value, the amount of the real estate taxes. Um, I, I didn't, and, and I will ask Warren or the applicant, I, I didn't see the listings of the property for sale or rent within the previous three years. Um, because there was any. Because there were none, you say? No, there was none because I, I live there. I bought my house to live there. So um, there is no listing. Okay. Um, so it does look like he provided the, the documents and they were uploaded as, um, as backup. Okay. So the unreasonable or undue economic hardship. Um, the code does st state that where strict enforcement of these provisions of the certificate of appropriateness would result in an unreasonable or undue 
economic hardship to the applicant, the board shall have the power to modify the provisions of this section, including adopted guidelines. The fact that compliance would result in some increase in cost should not be considered unreasonable or undue economic hardship if the use of the property is still economically viable. So just because it costs more, um, any applicant wishing to assert unreasonable or undue hardship must submit as a part of the application for a certificate of appropriateness, a written statement presenting the factual data establishing the economic hardship. Um, and then there's the list of, of items that they must provide, which he did include in his affidavit, which is uploaded uh, as backup and the, the board members should have access to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. I did all of I could, <laughs> having the information that was provided to me before I bought the house and while I'm living on the house. Okay. So, Ms. City Attorney, um, so just assuming that the board um, found that there was a hardship and it was challenged, um, what is your legal opinion on whether or not um, that action would be defensible? Well, the, the board does have a lot of discretion here. Um, I, I would obviously recommend to make um, findings and a reasoning um, on the record and to just treat these applications similarly. Um, so if a similar application comes and you know it, it's a similar situation um, to, to try to treat them the same um, but I do think that the board has um, has a lot of discretion. Um, and something else that's met specifically mentioned in the code is that if any of the board members feel like they need additional information, evidence, reports, et cetera, you can request those. Um, you know, I, I, I heard one of the board members mention a, um, a wind study or something along those lines. Right. Um, that would that could be submitted to the insurance company. Um, so if, if anybody feels that 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 would be um, helpful or necessary, that's something that's also within um, your power to to request. Mr. Hopper. Yes. I'd like to request. Um, a continuance on this and see if we can give the applicant time to look into other options. For example, the wind mitigation report, another insurance company, just to make sure that he's exhausted all possibilities. I'm not afraid of setting a precedent since these are unprecedented times um, with, with regard to COVID, but I do not want to make a decision without knowing that we've exhausted all possibilities on this. Uh, economic hardship exception. Is that a motion? Yes, that is a motion. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second to... What was the motion? It was to defer the item until the July 7th meeting, is that correct? Correct. I wouldn't need any new documents by today in order to go to July. So that's not Can the new documents be submitted to me via email? Well, I don't think he would be able to obtain the wind mitigation report that he right. needs. Like that. Oh, that would be impossible. I wish we, we had the magic. <laughs> well, Mr. Lacordo, it seems like the best outcome you're going to get today is um, it, it seems like you can end up being continued to uh, September. Um, and that would give you an opportunity to, I guess, shop around with other insurance companies. Um, get a wind mitigation report, see if your old insurance company maybe takes you back. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what you can do, but um, I, I think that's about as much relief as you're going to get from the board today. If the applicant um, had the information prior to the July meeting and submitted it to me, similar to the last application, would that be sufficient, Amber? To, to for me to read it into the record um 
Yes, I, I, I think that that would be fine as long as it's okay with the board members that it will be provided maybe the day of the meeting um, and, and you'll have to review it at that point. Um, but it, it's definitely permitted. I think that's uh, I'm okay with general that. agreement with the board. So it's motion is to defer to July 7th. And then, yes. Okay. And there were, who seconded that? That was Mr. Andrade? Correct. Yes. yes. I'll second it, Julie O'Dell. Yeah. Is there any other discussion on the motion? Let's have a roll call, please. Ms. Gabez Duros? Yes. Mr. Andrade? Yes. Mr. Colley? Yes. Ms. O'Dell? Yes. Mr. Prieto y Munoz? Yes. Mr. Trachtenberg? Yes. Mr. Tragash? Yes. And Dr. Hopper? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Can I, I just say something to the applicant real quick? Sure. Mr. Cuoto, I, I recommend you reach out to your county commissioner and your city of Miami commissioners uh, because they both have asked access to a lot of help versus, you know, going on with the COVID-19. They have all sorts of rent relief, mortgage relief. Um, you know, there's all sorts of loans. Um, and there's still time to see if you can get help anyway with your financial hardship. Uh, also, no, Dade Heritage. I, I, I with my mortgage. It's been three months that I haven't paid. Also. Okay. That was, you know, a good way for my bank. That I have the mortgage, so they provide me with help, relief. But at the end, I have to pay the entire mortgage, unrelated by the 31st of December of 2020. So it's, it's difficult, you know. Close me. I love my house, I love my place. It's, you know, one of those things that you are, you know, it is a very difficult time for me and for my husband. My husband is it's poor up until the second of October. I imagine. I understand. I wish you the best, and I hope the next time we meet, your circumstances are better. Thank you very much. Okay, we will see you in July. Before we move on, just really, Mr. Lacorda, do you understand what you're doing between now and July? What the document not, you should be providing? Not very much. I will have to to read it. Understand exactly what do I need to do. Okay, well, Mr. Uh, board Member Trey Gow, I believe it was, had recommended something specific. Um, perhaps he can explain to you again so that you're clear on, on at least what he wants or would like to see um, for the next meeting. Right. And I'm not suggesting that uh, that's what I want to see. What I'm suggesting is the insurance companies if you get an independent uh, wind mitigation inspection it's done by a certified inspector and they um they will list when, when they do the inspection the condition of your of your roof they list what the uh, useful life is and, and the insurance companies accept those because from what you said to me was they're telling you just because of the age they can't insure it anymore and this might be able to uh, offset that requirement of theirs, that if you have a certified inspection report saying there's useful life left, that they might, they should uh, comply with that. So this is Chris. I'm sorry. sorry. So just to follow up on that, with the intention being, Todd, that if he gets this wind mitigation report, he's able to seal up or do spot um, um, repairs and keep the life of your roof current until you're able to replace it in the right way with what's required for the neighborhood. Okay. I'll do my yeah. best. Trust me. I'm, and, and I'll just say, if this works out for you, then you don't, you were saying the difference is $5,000, 8,000 versus 13. You wouldn't have to spend even the uh, $8,000. So that, that could be a win-win, you know, win. even better for you. So do I need to look for an, an inspector? 
so that they can go to my house and check the room. What I, and I'm not that I give advice, but what I'll just share my experience. When I okay. spoke to my insurance broker who told me that they wouldn't be able to do this, I asked him uh, what I need to do. And he was able to say, give me some uh, names of inspection uh, inspectors, certified inspectors. It's not that expensive. It's a couple hundred dollars. Yeah, $350. And, uh, I did okay. it already when I bought the house. Right. And actually, that transaction, you can see it because I loaded it in, in my documents. They, he knew that sooner or later I needed to repair or to remove. Right. So maybe since you already have had one done, you can contact the same person that did it, I tell know. him to inspect the condition. What they usually do is if they uh, observe deficiencies, they identify what they are you can correct those and then they'll come out and reinspect it to confirm that those deficiencies have been fully addressed. Correct. And I asked, the, the, you know, several people that I, I asked for the budget for the, the replacement. The point is that the, it's a, the, way the roof is right now, it's in bad conditions, even though, you know, no leaking, only one in the kitchen. But he told me that the condition is very, very bad because it just needed to be replaced. So I had over 13 people that came mm -hmm. to, to provide me the budgets. And it was very difficult, very, right. very well, very few gave me, you know, the truth. And so very few were just looking for money. So I just stick to the one that yeah. I felt the truth, you know, that, you know. Um, you know, I, I don't know the condition of your roof, but mm -hmm. if you could have it repaired where it could be uh, certified in this inspection, that might even help you out more. Okay. I, I, I'm going to look for it. Thank you for your advice. It's very My good. My pleasure. Very good much. luck to you. And Best wishes. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Right. Now we're on to item number four. Um, we actually have the applicant from item number seven that she wishes to speak, and I believe the item needs to be continued. I don't know if you want to take that one out of order. If it's going to be continued, we can take it out of order. Okay. Help item number seven, file ID 7016, a resolution of the Historic and Environmental Preservation Board granting or denying the appeal filed by Coconut Grove Village Council of Intended Decision BD 18017520001 for the property located at approximately 228 Northwest 7th Avenue. And who is the appellant? You're on mute, Rachel. Now you're, now you're good. <laughs> Hi. Your address for the record. Good afternoon. My name is Rachel. Rachel Streitfeld, I am an attorney. Um, my law firm is Brightside Legal, 1455 North Treasure Drive, number 70 in North Bay Village. Um, I am really grateful to be here before you all tonight. Thank you, Beatrice, for taking me a little bit out of order. Um, the, uh, the appellant is the owner of 228 Northwest 7th Avenue. We filed this appeal timely on behalf of the owner. The written appeal is in fact in your backup. It's on my letterhead, Brightside Legal. The first sentence states very clearly that the appeal is on behalf of the owner, uh, 228 Northwest LLC. So I am entirely unclear as to how the notices and the title for this resolution got lost in translation. Um, I don't have any affiliation with the Coconut Grove Village Council. I've never represented them. They are not uh, really nearby the site where we appe are appealing this notice of intended decision. Um, and so uh, we had a flurry of emails earlier today about how to address this issue and my understanding is that we're going to be continued to July 7th so that we can send out new notice. Okay, so it's your request to have this item continued to the July 7th meeting. 
Um, I actually was under the impression that the city was requesting to have this continued to the July 7th meeting because of the administrative error that took place. Uh, are you opposed to it being continued to July 7th? I am not opposed to it being continued. Oh, bless you. Any questions or comments from the board? How about a motion? Thank you, Todd. I'll make a motion to uh, continue continue this. And what was the date that uh, we were, the applicant July made? 7th. July 7th to continue to, to July 7th hearing. I'll second that. Sorry, who second? Mr. Trackenberg. So it's been moved and seconded to uh, defer this until the July 7th meeting. Mr. Chair, may I make a request for a time certain? And the reason that I'm making such a request for a time certain is because um, if I were going to be here in Miami Dade County on July 7th, it would be no problem. I could spend the whole day with you all. However, I will be in Western North Carolina with my parents. And we are going to, not great, things, but we're going to need someone who is a notary to be able to scare me in. Um, and I'd rather not have to force that person to be present in our home for an extended period of time. So if, if we could do a time certain, that would be really appreciated. I think we can work on that. And I believe we can keep these four in at the start of the, start of the meeting anyway, so that you're not need to wait. You can be sworn in, sworn in as soon as the meeting is up. Right. Warren, you were breaking up, but I, I think what you were what you were saying was that um, applicants or appellants will have an opportunity at the beginning of the meeting to be sworn in for that reason. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, Mr. Adams and Ms. Moore. Thanks. And any other discussion on the motion? No, well, let's have a roll call, please. Mr. Tregash? Yes. Mr. Trachtenberg? Yes. Mr. Andrade? Yes. Mr. Colley? Yes. Ms. Galvez Duros? She seems to have stepped out. Ms. Odell? Yes. Mr. Prieto y Munoz? Yes. And Dr. Hopper? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good trip. We'll see you in July. Thank you. Okay, I believe we're on to item number four. File ID 7341, a resolution of the Miami Historic and Environmental Preservation Board pursuant to Section 23-6.2 of the City Code of Ordinances, approving or denying a special certificate of appropriateness to allow for alterations to a non-contributing residential structure located approximately at 571 Northeast 67th Street, Miami, Florida 33138 within the Palm, the Palm Grove Historic District. Is the applicant present? No applicant? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How are you doing? This is in regards to property 571 Northeast 67th Street, correct? That's correct. Okay. Are you the applicant? Uh, yes, sir, we are. Could you give your name and address for the record, please? My name is Shannon Davis, 113 Northwest 3rd Avenue, Dania Beach. Okay, and we'll start with a staff report, and then we'll turn it over to you. I'm sorry, were, were you sworn in, sir? No. Uh -oh. Okay. Do you have um, somebody there that can, do you have a notary public that can swear you in at your location? Uh, let me see if 
how far they are and I can find out. Give me just one minute, please. Okay. Okay. The notary is approximately three minutes away. Would you mind if we started with a staff report while you're waiting? I can do that. Is that all right with you, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank Go you. Pursuant to section 23-6.2 of the City Code of Ordinances as amended, the applicant is requesting a special COA to allow for alterations to a non-contributing residential structure. The subject property is non-contributing structure within the Palm Grove Historic District, the amended plat of Morningside and the Upper East Side net area. And there's a bit of history in this property. On January 2nd, 2018, the HEP approved the SCOA for demolition of a non-contributing structure and the new construction of a five-storey high multi-family residence with a rooftop terrace. A restrictive covenant was also issued where the neighbouring property 563 Northeast 67th Street of the same owner as property 571 Northeast 67th Street would not seek an allowance higher than T3L. The HEP decision was appealed to the Miami City Commission by the Palm Grove Historic Preservation Board and the Mimo Biscayne Association Board. On May 24, 2018, the HEP special COA was modified by the Miami City Commission with approved resolution R180226, whereas the multifamily residence will have four storeys high with a rooftop terrace. The multifamily residence will not exceed the height of 45 feet to the roof, excluding the rooftop terrace. The multifamily residence will be built substantially in accordance with revised architectural plans dated May 24, 2018, and all other conditions by special COE set forth in resolution HEPR 18.002 continue in effect. On June 6, 2019, an appeal of the decision to the circuit court was denied. Appellate case number 2018-000208-AP-01 and lower court case number 2018-3705. At this time, the building permit application is inactive as no further action was taken to obtain the demolition and new construction permit. Since the court did not issue a stay for the special COA, the time limitations per section 23-6.2G apply. This states any certificate of appropriateness issued pursuant to the provisions of this section shall expire 12 months from the date of issuance unless the authorised work is commenced within this time or a building permit has been obtained. The preservation officer may grant an extension of time not to exceed 12 months upon written request by the applicant unless the board's guidelines as they may relate to the authorised work have been amended. The applicant is proposing to re-roof the structure's hip roof with new GAF Energy Star asphalt shingles in weatherwood colour. 
the original roofing shown in the tax card and historic photograph is cement tile. The applicant has submitted a letter claiming the criteria of energy and cost efficiency to install asphalt shingles and requests the board take this into consideration and approve the installation of the proposed roof finish. The letter states that the roof had been previously changed to an existing shingle roof and that they feel it is more energy and cost efficient to install shingles. Pursuant to section 23-6.2 of the City of Miami Code of Ordinances, as amended, and the Secretary of Interior Standards, the Preservation Office recommends denial of the special certificate of appropriateness. Okay. Has your notary public arrived? Yes, sir, she has. Okay, if you wouldn't mind asking them to swear you in. Can you please swear me in? I don't know what to say, Shane. Do swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Thank you, sir. Do you swear to tell me the truth and nothing but the tr truth? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. Is there anything you would like to add to the staff report? Did you guys hear that? Yes. So, in regards to this roof, when the pro property was purchased, it had a shingle roof on it. We applied for a permit to re-roof the property, and that's when they're stating to us that it is a historic district and it has to have a tile roof but it's already went through the permitting the process and everything and, and it's been approved for the previous existing roof so they they put a shingle roof on it before how come we can't put a shingle roof back on it today who wants to answer that question <laughs> Staff only have the ability to approve the original roof covering. Um, anything that is not the original roof covering must be reviewed by the Historic Preservation Board. So staff does not have the authority to approve this, which is why it's with the board at the moment. Um, I can try and look into our records and see if there was a previous COA for the shingle roof. Um, if you would like me to try and look into that. When was the... Roof put on last. I can try and get the records and see if we have that information. Sir, do you know when the roof was last repair, re replaced? No, sir. I, I don't have that information in front of me. Uh, let me see if I can find out real quick. Okay. Do you know when the first permit was pulled for the property? No, no. When was the roof replaced? The roof has not been replaced yet. We have process for permitting. The existing roof was a shingle roof. I do when not know when that was replaced. You don't know when that roof was put on? No, sir. Okay. I'm going to see if we can find out now. Hold on one second, please. Okay. Well, when we apply for it? That's a quick question. Is there a shingle roof on there now? Yes, sir. There's an existing shingle roof on there now. And and you and you want to replace the existing shingle roof with shingles? Correct. Now, uh, uh, Miami-Dade County uh, requires Energy Star shingles. So we did switch it to an Energy Star system. Okay. And, and I guess staff uh mr mr adams the, the basis of the denial is what um the historic district was created in 2009 so if the existing shingles were installed prior to 2009 there would have been no requirement for a board review when an applicant comes in to re roof a property in a historic structure or a historic district, staff only has the authority to approve the original roof covering, which in this case was cement tile. If the applicant does not want to install the original roof covering, they must come to the board for review of the application and the board will determine if they can install the requested roof covering. So all staff has the authority to do in this case is approve cement tile. 
because that is not what the applicant wants to do, it's brought to the board for their consideration. And that's the way the guidelines are written. They're, they're very, very clear. Right, but the, the, the staff report is recommending denial. And I'm, I'm trying to understand um, staff, why. Staff, staff cannot recommend approval because the, the guidelines prohibit. The, the guidelines only allow staff to approve the original roof covering. So even though we're recommending denial, this is now with the board for their determination. We can't. We cannot recommend approval in this case. When, when this, I guess, district was created in two thousand nine, was there any type of you know grandfathering in of of existing properties in their current condition? Or the, the only grandfathering in is that when a new district is created, property owners are not required to go out and make changes. However, when a change is is necessary. In other words, replacing a new roof, then they must follow what is included in the guidelines. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just reiterate that is very common, especially with uh, as districts are being created uh, on an ongoing basis. That the, you can't compel or require a, a homeowner to replace anything in their home. It's when they elect to replace it, then you can require what they can replace it with. And so uh, that is almost the uh, strategy that over time, and it might take uh, 20 years, 40 years, whatever, that it will see, um, the historic district will over time better represent what its uh, original historic uh, look was. And our historic district design guidelines are, are very, very clear on what staff can review and approve and what must go to the board. And they're very clear on if the applicant wishes to do something different, then it must it must go to the board for, for their review. So, can, so I ask, can I ask a question? This is Chris. Sorry. Um, so in this... The original roof tiles were the cement tiles. Were cement tiles? Is that correct, Warren? Yes. Historically, yes. Historically, they were before the district was created, and then the district was created. So, the catch now is that when you go to re -roof, you know, when you go to replace those roof tiles, you've got to go back technically to the historic condition. You can't approve these new type of shingles at the staff level. That's correct. However, the board do have the authority to. Right. Okay. And then, so were all of these residences here that have shingle roofs, were, or were they all cement tile back then? Do we know that from the historic photos and things of that nature? We have historic photos and historic tax cards. Um, in some cases, the guidelines allow the change of original roofing materials. So for instance, if someone originally had a metal roof, tin shingles, we're not going to insist to put shingles back. So the guidelines do allow an alternative material there, the same as for wood shingles. But in circumstances where there were clay barrel tiles, flat cement roofing tiles, um, the, the guidelines are clear that that must be, must be reviewed by the board if the applicant wishes to do something different. Uh, Warren, I have a question for you. Um, the discussion on the history of the, of the various SOCs that were issued for this property, specifically with the demolition uh, and then the entire appeal process through the city and, and the various courts, um, is that's completely outside the purview of this request, correct? Or this is just for context? Yeah, this is just for context. Basically, the original application was to demolish this property and build um, build a new structure, which would ultimately be four stories high with a rooftop terrace. Um, that effectively has expired because the COA is only good for one year and they did not apply for an extension. So that's just there to let you know that there, there, there was a previous application for this property. We're not sure what's happen, happening with it, but all you are here to review is the- We're review. not moving forward with that project. And, and, and you, sir, are the, the same owner that went through that original process? 
Correct. We're not moving forward with that project anymore. But your intent is just to re-roof? Correct. Yes, sir. Uh, Warren, could you clarify why this property was non-contributing? Um, Jen, normally pro a contributing property contributes to the historic character of the neighborhood. Um, that would be a property that hasn't been altered too much, a property that was built within a certain time period. It could be of a particular style. And it's normally determined that any properties that have been altered or do not conform to the historic character of the neighborhood or were built at a later date, normally they are classed as non-contributing properties. Um, when the application was submitted um, for the demolition and the new construction, the staff member did a fairly detailed analysis of why she believed this property should be contributing, and that was included in the report. However, the board never, um, that wasn't even discussed, or there was no consideration to, to make it contributing. So basically, originally, it just didn't meet the, the, the requirements of the district. It didn't meet the period of significance, the architectural styles, or basically the years of construction. Um, and so it was determined to be non-contributing. Every five or 10 years, it's good to resurvey districts because properties can become contributing within time, but that has never been done for this property. And as I said, the analysis um, presented to the board previously, and um, there was no move to actually make it contributing at that time. Understood. Uh, with regard to, uh, and this is a question for, for the owner, uh, Mr. Is it Arena? Yes. Oh, uh, so the, the, I mean, I suppose that the, whether the permit was issued for this roof to be an asphalt roof is probably immaterial because this district wasn't created until 2009, and I'm guessing that the roof predates that. Um, as far as costs, have you uh, procured costs for an asphalt uh, roof versus the concrete tile roof, or have you only priced out the asphalt option? There, there's approximately a 20 to 25 percent higher increase between a shingle and a tile roof. And what's the scale of the re-roofing, approximately? Uh, Cost-wise, meaning? Yeah. Uh, you'd have to give me one second to look it up. Yeah, appreciate that. Has there been an indication that this was a hard economic hardship? Economic hardship was not requested. Thank you. Warren, um, what, are the what do the roofs look like on the surrounding properties? From memory, I believe there is a mixture of flat roofs and barrel tile, but I can have a quick, quick check for you. Yes, the adjacent property to the west has flat roof and barrel tiles. The property across the street is a flat roof. Diagonally from this property looks to be a property of a similar age, and that is an asphalt shingle roof. Um, if you go further down the street, there are there's one more with an asphalt shingle, um, two more with three more with asphalt. Um, another one with asphalt shingles, um, more asphalt shingles, flat roof. Really, the um, the entire neighborhood is really a mixture of flat roof, flat concrete tile, barrel tile, and shingle. And this has been a constant um, sort of discussion source from within the neighborhood as to are asphalt shingles appropriate. The general consensus from the neighborhood association seems to be that they want to see the, the, the guidelines enforced. Um, but Pam Grove in particular is one neighborhood where we have had a lot of requests for economic hardship exactly for this reason. 
and whether it's someone who has a leaking roof or whether it's someone that does have a financial hardship. So, so Pam Grove really is a, is a mixture and this really is an issue that I think I even said to the board six months ago, you can expect these applications to start coming in because they are starting to build up and a number of people are asking, requesting economic hardship. There is approximately, uh, it's $15,000 for shingle. You're at $26,000 for a tile roof. All right, thank you for that. Yes, sir. Any other questions for the applicant or staff? Or is that Ms. Gavas Toros? Yes, it is. Go ahead. Um, I'm we sorry. You, though. What was the date of purchase of the property? The year? Give me one second. Let me look that up. I'm sorry. Okay. It seems to me that one of the issues we're having is that as people move into these neighborhoods and they get turned over, they're not aware of the uh, historic districts and they're not aware of the guidelines. And so I, I would point out the applicant recently went through a very, very major application to the Historic Preservation Board. So I would suggest that they, they are aware. The property was purchased in uh, March 2nd, 2017. So, so well after it was uh, his visit. Other questions? Uh, this is Chris. I just have one general question. So is the is the reason for going with the, the asphalt tiles because of cost? That sounds like, I mean, it, the, it wasn't mentioned that an economic hardship was part of this. Then the concrete tiles are the historic tiles. And so my question is to the, is to the applicant, sir, is that why you're opposed to doing the concrete tiles? Because in my opinion, just think you know talking out loud that i would think that it would make the structure worth a lot more if you went to the historic um type of tile that was there originally as opposed to the the shingles well the cost is a, is a big difference as you can see sure and when we purchased the home it had shingle roof on it so we were going back in kind with a shingle roof we didn't know 30 years ago that it had a tile roof on it and we'd have to put a tile roof back on. Just to add, add to that um, statement, you're in a historic neighborhood, which actually is is quite a quite a nice neighborhood, and it's evolving very well. I'm sure you know that the rent um, um, rates that you can get in a neighborhood are, are much higher than other neighborhoods, um, and that are not considered historic neighborhoods. So, um, unless you have economic hardship, I, I don't think I'd be able to approve a separate uh, or different type of roofing system than um, was originally um, placed on the home um, back in the, what year was it when this home was built? 19, uh, Warren? What? I'm sorry, you're on mute. Let me just check, I'm just looking at one. Nineteen fifty-seven. Yeah. So it would it would nice be nice to, to see what the house uh, uh, looked like in nineteen fifty-seven brought back uh, to, to today's. Is there any way that I can say something? Um, no, because I don't think we have a public hearing. Bear with us for a minute because this is Zoom and we're trying to get our procedures down, but I'm looking, there you are. Uh, is the public hearing closed for public comment? I'm, I'm with the ownership group. He, he's one were, of were the owners. Oh, I'm sorry. My, I'm sorry. Were you sworn in, sir? I wasn't. I just wanted to make a quick comment, that's all that um, I, I do understand with the- Well, hold on, hold on. I'm sorry, if, if you weren't sworn in, we were very clear 
our ordinance is clear. We met with all of the applicants. Um, this is this is a hearing. Um, if you're if you if you want to say something, you need to be sworn in. I don't have uh, my notary here with me. That's okay. Okay, I, I apologize. We tried to make it very clear with meeting with the applicants, um, reminding them, letting them know the requirements. I, I didn't get the emails, but it's okay. That's fine. I have my notary here. Can she swear Mr. Uh, Bridges in? Not unless he's in the same room. Unfortunately not. Okay, sorry. Uh, Mr. Adams, is, is there a, um, I guess, a, a value threshold um, that, that triggered this process? For example, if he was just repairing his existing roof, um, would he have to go through this process versus replacing it? No, it would depend how much he was actually repairing. If they are minor repairs, say repairing certain leaks, they could go ahead and actually use the asphalt shingle to do the repairs. Um, there's nothing prohibiting an, an applicant from doing that. However, once the board, once the repairs go beyond a certain level, which is really not not quantified, then they would have to they would have to submit an application. But general repair of an existing roof wouldn't even require a certificate of appropriateness or a staff level review. So, it, Mr. for the applicant, is that what happened here? Um, you would see whatever the threshold is. <coughs> for your comment, the roof is actually unrepairable. The roof is unrepairable, but anything that is over $2,500 in a repair would require a permit. So, that means we would re approve a repair permit to repair the roof, but we wouldn't approve replacing the roof with the same product? Right. So, um, uh, this is a I question mean, for the applicant. Sorry, go yes, ahead. Sir. Oh, it's, uh, I'm looking at a, just trying to get a better perspective on the property. I'm looking at a- We're still bringing up- Sorry? No, go ahead. Uh, I'm looking at a recent Google Street View from March 2020, and from the street, it looks like there is roof work being done. And I see some felt paper being laid down and some shingles on the roof and the tar bucket. Uh, has some repairs been done? Has some work been done on this roof already? That's correct. Work has been done on the roof already. The roof was leaking so bad. We have removed the roof and dried it in with a 30-pound felt to get it watertight. The permit was got it, so it's just that. not, and it's still it's just down to the, it's still holding the felt. That's where it's at right now. Correct. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other questions? Are we ready for a motion? I'll make a motion to uh, deny the application. And um, let me just put in correct terms. Um, a motion to deny a special certificate of appropriateness to allow for alterations to a non-contributing residential structure located approximately at 571 Northeast 67th Street on the Florida within the Palm Grove Historic District. No, no. The, uh, motion is there a motion I'll second. Mr. Trachtenberg has seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, can we have a roll call, please? I got a question, though. Would it make sense for me to leave the roof the, the way it is, looking in bad, terrible condition, instead of upgrading it to a better white shingle that's going to make the home look better and also help the community look better? Or should we just leave the place ran down? Then you can through hardship. Hardship. It's not that easy to spend an extra eleven, twelve thousand dollars. We're in the middle of a motion, taking a vote. I think any type of questions like that should should be after the motion's uh, voted on. Sorry about. That. Can we have a roll call, please. Mr. Tragash. Yes. Mr. Trachtenberg. Yes. Mr. Andrade. No. Mr. Carley? Yes. Ms. Galvez Duros?
Let's go as turtles. You seem to have lost Ms. Galvez Toros. Yes. There she is. Yes. There is we go. Done? Yes. Mr. Prieto y Muñoz? Yes. And Dr. Hopper? Yes. Motion passes by a vote of seven to one. And this decision is final and let's appeal to the hearing board section within 15 days. So we have to put the tile roof back on it from my understanding, correct? Unless you appeal to the city commission. Okay. Thank you guys for your time. Okay. Ready for item number five? Step item number five, file ID 7340. A resolution of the Miami Historic and Environmental Preservation Board pursuant to section 23-4 of the City Code of Ordinances, approving or denying the preliminary evaluation of local designation as an historic resource for the property located at approximately 1811 Northwest 4th Court, Miami, Florida 33136 with the folio number 0131360730040. Who's the applica applicant for this item? The applicant in this case is the city of Miami. Um, the property owner, this this is a church. Um, I don't believe they have a lot of funding, so we agreed that we would we would sponsor this one to help them through the process. Okay. So this one is actually being submitted by the city. Okay. So you want to start with the staff report? Okay, pursuant to section 23-4 of the City Code of Ordinances as amended, the applicant is requesting a preliminary evaluation for the designation of St. Peter's Antiochian Orthodox Catholic Church, located on a parcel zone T4L, General Urban Transect Zone. The subject is a church property located within the Town Park Subdivision Number 7 and the Overtown Net Area. Preliminary evaluation report prepared by Anna Perez was presented to the city by Dade Heritage Trust, who explained the property owner is supportive of historic designation. City staff undertook two site visits to the property. On the first visit, December 1st, 2017, it was clear repairs were required to the roof, especially around the northwest corner tower area and to the interior. By the time of the second visit on February 5th, 2020, the repairs had been almost completed. The submitted preliminary evaluation states the church is historically significant for its association to E. L. Peterson, the first black archdiocese in Florida of the American Catholic Church, whose work reflects the beginning of racial equality in our national and local history and as a, is an excellent example of masonry vernacular architecture. The report states the property may be eligible for designation under the following criteria as numbered in section 23-4 of the city code. One is associated in a significant way with the life of a person important in the past. The building is associated with E.L. Peterson, the first black archdiocese of the American Catholic Church in Florida, a historically predominantly white Anglican institution. Two is the site of a historic event with significant effect upon the community, city, state or nation. The church served as the home base for E.L. Peterson, the first black archdiocese in Florida of the American Catholic Church. This event made a significant contribution towards racial equality in Florida and the rest of America. Five, embodies those distinguishing characteristics of an architectural style or period or method of construction. The building is an excellent example of masonry vernacular architecture in Miami. Ordinarily, cemeteries, birthplaces or graves of historical figures owned by religious institutions or used for religious purposes structures that have been moved from their original location, reconstructed historic buildings, properties primarily commemorative in nature and properties that have achieved significance within the past 50 years, shall not be considered eligible for listing in the Miami Register of Historic Places. However, such properties will qualify for designation if they are integral parts of districts or multiple property designations that do meet the criteria or if they fall within the following categories. Number seven relates to a religious property deriving primary significance from architectural 
or artistic distinction or historical importance. This building derives its historical significance from its architectural style and its association with E.L. Peterson, Florida's first black archdiocese of the American Catholic Church, a historically predominantly white Anglican institution. The initial site visits suggest the church retains much of its integrity with regard to design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling and association. The Preservation Office staff notes that further significance could be established during the research process. Pursuant to Section 23-4 of the City of Miami Code as amended and the Secretary of the Interior Standards, the Planning and Zoning Department recommends that the preliminary evaluation for the designation of the property located at 1811 Northwest 4th Court as a locally designated individual historic resource be approved so that further research can be conducted. This will allow staff the time necessary to conduct the additional research required to finalise the analysis as to the significance of the structure. And I believe then um, there was a message earlier from Deed Heritage Trust and um, supporting this application. Right. Any discussion from the board? Just one, I think you should check your um, terminology. I believe Father Peterson was a bishop, not an archdiocese. An archdiocese is an area, not a person. Yes, um, basically what we did was take the report that was submitted to us and just converted it into um, the, the standard format for the city. It's been a bit difficult recently to do any additional <coughs> research, so we just submitted it as is on the understanding that, that yes, more research is needed. Any other discussion? Uh, I'd, I'd like to make a motion. Go ahead. I'd like to make a motion that a preliminary evaluation for the designation of the property located at 1811 Northwest Fourth Court uh, as a locally designated individual historic resource be approved so that further research can be conducted. Second. Motion, motion to second. Any discussion on the motion? Can we have a roll call, please? Who was the second? Louis Prieto. Mr. Trachtenberg? Yes. Mr. Prieto y Muñoz? Yes. yes. Mr. Andrade? Yes. Mr. Colleagues? Yes. Ms. Gavis Turros? Yes. We, we need your video on also. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Odell? Yes. Your video? It's here. Oh, yes, yes. I've had terrible communication issues. <laughs> Mr. Tragash? Yes. And Dr. Hopper? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. And we're on to number six. Is the applicant present? Or the applicant's attorney or architect? Here, property owner. Property, property owner. owner. Have you been sworn in? I am the um, notary. So, Chad Lowith, do you swear or attest that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Up item number six, file ID 7509. The resolution of the Miami Historic and Environmental Preservation Board pursuant to section 23-14 of the City Code of Ordinances, approving or denying an application for an ad valorem tax exemption part one for a property located approximately at 601 Northeast 56th Street, Miami, Florida, 33137 within the Miami Modern Historic District. Okay, we'll start with the Stafford. Oh, I'm sorry. Can the property owner give his name and address for the record? Sure. Um, Chad Lois, and the property is 601 Northeast uh, 56th Street, and it is 
Miami at 33137. Are you there now? I am. Well, we could almost go out my front door and wave at you. Uh, but we'll start with the staff report, please. Yeah, um, I should point out that the title should see this is in the morning side historic district. There's a, a slight error in the title, I've just been informed. So that should oh, be. Oh, no. Yes. So just for, for the record, for clarification. Um, pursuant to section 23-14 of the City Code of Ordinances as amended, the applicant is requesting approval of the ad valorem property tax exemption for historic resources, part one application for an existing single family residential structure. The property is located within the Morningside Historic District Bistro subdivision and Upper East Side net area. The applicant came before the HEP on January 7th, 2020 for an addition and alterations of the structure. The application was approved under HEP R 20004. The work approved included a new second story addition above the one story wing and a new one story wing to the north. Alterations to the structure included replacement of windows with impact resistant windows with a black aluminum frame. The applicant is applying for the ad valorem tax exemption part one for the following improvements to the property. Removal of old windows and doors to be replaced with new impact resistant windows. Removal of old roofing tile and installation of new barrel tiles to match existing. New one and two storey additions of 1216 square feet. All proposed renovations meet the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation and the City of Miami guidelines for historic sites and districts as approved in the previous resolution issued by the Historic and Environmental Preservation Board. Pursuant to section 23-14 of the City of Miami Code of Ordinances as amended and the Secretary of the Interior Standards, the Planning Department recommends approval of the application for ad valorem tax exemption for historic properties, part one. Thank you. Is there anything you'd like to add to the staff report? No. Thank you. Any discussion, questions from the board? Hello. Is that you, Mr. Andrade? No questions? Motion? I'll make a motion to approve an application for an ad valorem tax exemption, part one, for property located approximately at 601 Northeast 56th Street, Miami, Florida. Uh, within the Miami Modern Historic District. No, in the Morningside Historic District. I'm reading the, uh, okay. Uh, I'll second that with the correction. Thank you. The, uh, was that? that was Mr. Trackenberg. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, can we have a roll call please? <clears throat> Mr. Tragash? Yes. Mr. Trachtenberg? Yes. Mr. Andrade? Yes. Mr. Colley? Yes. Ms. Gavis Turros? Yes. Ms. Odell? Yes. Mr. Prieto y Munoz? Yes. And Dr. Hopper? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks to everyone. Uh, is there anything else to come before the board? No, that's everything. Great. I want you to notice it's just a little after 6.30. So thank you, everyone, for making this first virtual meeting a success. And we'll keep plugging in there. Is there a motion to adjourn? Dr. Hopper, I would like to make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Trachtenberg. Is there a second? Second. Second. <laughs> As Ms. Odell, I recognize you as a second. Any discussion on that motion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. See you in July. Bye-bye. Okay.